good morning. Uh, good morning to all who have uh, uh, joined the uh, join uh, online, um, as well as that who have gathered here at the auditorium uh, for the uh, workshop organized by the uh, expert SLMA expert committee on medical rehabilitation as a pre-Congress activity of the 134th anniversary International Medical Congress of the Sri Lanka Medical Association um, on this uh, uh, very nice morning. Uh, just uh, initially, let me warmly, very warmly welcome all of you, uh, particularly for the interest and the commitment to, uh, uh, I mean, for me to uh, remind you of your interest and the commitment that you had uh, with regard to uh, 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 going through this training program and to uh, learn and uh, to get some skills on rehabilitation of stroke patients. Uh, you know, stroke is a, a very common entity and uh, very poorly developed uh, uh, here, particularly in any of the developing countries as well as here in Sri Lanka, owing to many reasons. Uh, one particular uh, important reason is that we are not having adequate infrastructure facilities in hospitals. And also that lack of experience of doctors, particularly junior doctors, as well as seniors, also contribute to a great extent for uh, poor development of stroke rehabilitation. Uh, that's why we, as the uh, expert committee on medical rehabilitation, thought that we need to do this workshop as a pre-congress activity and to let our doctors learn of every aspect of uh, stroke rehabilitation. Uh, you know that this program, which is funded by the World Health Organization, I'm very thankful to World Health Organization for funding, providing us with funds for this program, went through a very tedious process in organizing this. And uh, uh, this program involves a comprehensive book that will be printed and the hard copies would be available. And there are many authors who have contributed for development of this book. Uh, I'm very thankful to Dr. Uh, Champika Gunavadana and Dr. Ajini Arasalingam for their interest taken in organizing this program as well as particularly in arranging the book. We had to do it uh, uh, fairly fast because the time that was given for printing the book was very short. So we have let you have the access link for the uh, soft copy, the online uh, copy of it. But then the uh, uh, maybe in another few weeks that we would see that you receive your hard copy of the book. Uh, and also now uh, we had five uh, uh, Zoom lectures, consecutive lectures, uh, and they are very resource persons. I'm very thankful to those resource persons. And now we have the workshop. And uh, you know, I, I mean, I just need not tell you the prevailing situation of the country, and uh, you would uh, uh, will understand the difficulty of having an in-person workshop for this type of a uh, 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 condition uh, at this point of time, particularly at a time that the gatherings have been banned. Uh, therefore, I mean, if I need to tell you that many of our resource also had become either patients or contacts. Therefore, we uh, had to um, make many alterations of the program, including uh, make the change in the venue. If otherwise we, to improve participation, we wanted to have it at the hospital, but then we had to change the venue. And then uh, we wanted to accommodate a little bit more uh, uh, in-person participation that the game had to be changed. And even the methods that we conduct the program had been remarkably a sort of a change. And we try our best to do our best to uh, communicate the message uh, using technology uh, and without, uh, uh, I mean, sort of a, without uh, making, uh, without, uh, 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 without causing much uh, damage to the contents that will be communicated. Uh, so just bear with us for our shortcomings. Uh, but uh, uh, we would be trying our best to do the best. And then at the end of the program, we would be, uh, there will be a certificate awarded for the program. I mean, we have let anyone that who were interested in joining the uh, uh, program online today at uh, here uh, at the uh, auditorium as well as uh, online, 
but uh, the certificate will be awarded for doctors that uh, who join the uh, lectures as well as the workshop. Uh, with that uh, bit of uh, introduction, and also as the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, let me remind you that now, I mean, it is in this year that we started the uh, expert committee on medical rehabilitation. And you all who have interest in medical rehabilitation, you will be joining the uh, uh, teams, particularly of the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association. And when you are interested in doing community programs, education programs, you would realize that if you are not a member of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, that how much that would affect you of becoming a member of any of these committees. So I just need to remind all doctors, Sri Lanka Medical Association is your professional organization and the online membership have been made available for all doctors. It's just a matter of that you log in and apply for the membership. So just uh, log in to the website of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. And if you are not already a member, uh, do not delay, uh, apply for membership and obtain your membership. And it's just the life membership what you need to request for. Uh, so with that uh, uh, note, uh, let me now invite the uh, first presenter of uh, this uh, workshop. The, uh, this actually was uh, supposed to be a um, practical type of a workshop with a demonstration of a multidisciplinary team. Uh, I think that uh, the speaker would see that that everything is communicated well here uh, uh, um, using virtual platform. So our speaker today is Dr. Champika Gunawadana, consultant neurologist who has undergone a special training in uh, particularly neuro rehabilitation while the, uh, uh, undergoing his neurologist training in United States. Uh, so uh, let me invite Dr. Champil Gunavadana, uh, the consultant neurologist teaching hospital Ratnapura to make his presentation. Champika, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, madam, uh, for your kind introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank SLMA for three things. Firstly, uh, to select stroke rehabilitation as one of the key areas to uh, discuss in your pre-Congress workshops uh, uh, going along with the uh, annual academic sessions. And then to arrange this type of meeting uh, uh, with this uh, current situation affected very badly in the country, going through a lot of hardships and challenges. And finally, inviting me as one of the resource persons. So good morning to all of you, and we will proceed with the stroke rehabilitation uh, and multidisciplinary care as part of the uh, introduction of this workshop. Uh, right. What is stroke rehabilitation? You all know it's a process of helping person to achieve a highest level of function, independence, and quality of uh, good quality of life after a disability. It is a mechanism where we use relearning skills which are suddenly lost as a result of damage in the part of the brain. And apart from learning skills, it is uh, learning new ways to compensate of remaining disabilities. So why do we need to discuss about stroke rehabilitation? If you look at the statistic, it is one of the main causes for long-term disability around the world. Especially in adult age group, that is the number one cause for disability. And about 70% of them are severely disabled even after three months of stroke, despite of all the acute, um, uh, the development of an advancement of acute stroke care. Still 70% of them have substantial amount of disability at, uh, at three months of uh, post stroke. So it is, uh, it has a huge disability related, uh, disability and functional impairments and causing a lot of care burden and social impact. So who needs stroke rehabilitation? Do all these stroke survivors need uh, rehabilitation or it's only for selected people? If you look at the statistic again, 10% of the patient uh, who have gone through the stroke, 
get complete, near complete, spontaneous recovery. But still, if they get rehabilitation, this recovery process will be faster. And 10% of them do not get any benefit out of rehabilitation due to severity of the lesion. But still for them, even they have a massive uh, disability, the survival benefits are there if they get adequate, appropriate rehabilitation. The remaining 80% without any doubt, they will get a significant benefit from rehabilitation process. So at the end, all of all the stroke survivors get some benefit out of stroke rehabilitation. So it is for each and every stroke survivor, but we have to design it depending on their disabilities. Just to recapitulate what we know about stroke recovery, stroke recovery has two components. One is neurological recovery, the other one is functional recovery. Neurological recovery, you all know, that is improvement of the neurological deficit caused by the damage of the brain. It has different mechanism. It is very early spontaneous recovery without any reason. That is getting the blood supply back or else recovering the penumbral area in a little lower. Even after some time, without any rehabilitation or any medication, they get improved. How, do that, how does that happen? That is the neuroplasticity. That is the the recovery mechanism of the brain and nerve cells in the brain. So neurological recovery is that, and that is the improvement of the deficit, the uh, neurological deficit. What is functional recovery? Functional recovery is the recovery in day-to-day uh, -day function with adaptation or training. That is the area where we focused in our rehabilitation process. So our main focus is functional recovery. Functional recovery is more important than neurological recovery. If you know that neurological recovery, the people, patient might say that I can lift my hand from the, for five inches to nine inches. Does it make any sense? No, there's no functional benefit out of it. But more than that, what we need, even without any significant neurological improvement, if their function can be improved, then it is more important for the patient and his independence uh, and activities of daily living. So return of motor power does not synonymous with recovery of function. Even without significant neurological recovery, we can achieve functional recovery. Functional recovery defines the improvement of activities of daily living. So the rehabilitation process is predominantly focused on functional recovery. So when to start stroke rehabilitation? It has quite controversy when to start rehabilitation pro uh, program. Standard settings often within 48 hours, we have to uh, start uh, stroke rehabilitation once acute problems are stabilized. Earlier, the better. Outcome will improve if we start it earlier. Early admission to stroke unit has shown improved functional outcomes and uh, reduced mortality. So there is an element called very early mobilization. Very early mobilization is what? If to start a rehabilitation process within the first 24 hours, there is enough evidence to support that it will improve outcomes, but you have to design it frequent, short duration, out of bed sessions. If you go for a high dose mobilization within the first 24 hours, there will be detrimental uh, unfavorable outcome. So we have to be little careful when you arrange and time the rehabilitation process. Where to start, uh, where to have the stroke rehabilitation? What is the best setting for stroke rehabilitation? It depends on the in intensity of the, uh, the care facility and the disability. So we have to balance both. Most intensive rehabilitation occur or conduct in uh, in patient level. So the usual design is three hours per day, five to six days per week, uh, up to three weeks at least. It is in institutional care with multidisciplinary approach. Subacute rehabilitation is mainly targeting a mild disabilities for skilled nursing facilities, maybe on and off therapy inputs. Patients who get discharged, even at community level, they need rehabilitation. We do not have 
in Sri Lanka, we do not have home-based rehabilitation, but it is uh, one of the best method to use home-based rehabilitation. The, what we use in Sri Lanka is outpatient clinic. So whatever the method at community level after discharge, also they need rehabilitation inputs. If you look at statistics, there was a remarkable um, the landmark trial um, in 2002 about the setting of uh, stroke rehabilitation, stroke unit versus general medical wards. It has clearly shown that functional outcome, improvement of functional outcome as well as mortality uh, is very high, significant, clinically significant if we manage them in a stroke unit. So you can understand managing them in a stroke unit is very, very important. So how are we going to, why do we need a stroke rehabilitation process and how do we uh, design a structure for stroke rehabilitation? Stroke disabilities, you should have an understanding about the disabilities. Stroke is one of the main diseases where you get wide range of disabilities. If you look at it, it can be in the motor system, sensory system, communication, cognition, visual, emotional, all aspects can involved. So they get huge vary of uh, disabilities. If you look at the motor system, paralysis, loss of coordination, loss of balance and dysphagia. If you look at sensory, again, loss of sensation, blood bubble uh, involvement, chronic pain, they all are significant disabilities which stroke patients come across. Communication, again, you know, language problems, dysphagia, aphasia, Cognition can affect memory, learning, and awareness, and hemineglect. Visual impairments and emotional involvement and psychiatric, uh, uh, psychiatric involvement is again there. So, when you look at those disabilities, we have to identify them, and that is the key principle of uh, stroke rehabilitation process. Identify the impairments and disabilities and careful at attention to uh, comorbidities and associated complications. Then we have to set goals to um, improve those impairments. This, after setting goals, there has to be a early goal directed treatment. And then there has to be systematic assessment in between to analyze the progress and experience interdisciplinary team should be involved in this process and there has to be an education both patient and uh, carer and professionals involved in the process and finally there has to be a comprehensive discharge plan uh, to improve the final outcome of the patient so if you look at how are we going to do basic goal setting goal should be specific target oriented and these goals should be measurable and achievable. So it has to be realistic goals. And we have to uh, focus in time periods. How are we going to set goals? And then only we can get a best result out of it. And as I mentioned earlier, there should be a periodic assessment to analyze the improvement and the progression of the uh, rehabilitation process and patient, uh, patient's functional outcome. So there are a number of different disability assessment tools, Bartel score and kin and uh, functional impairment major, um, uh, uh, assessment. So these assess, uh, assessment tools should be objective, systematic, and we have to do it periodically. Now we'll move on to multidisciplinary care. Why do we need a multidisciplinary care in in anything. As a concept, if we are facing a challenging problem, we need a collaboration and coordination as the key things for successful mechanism to achieve something, uh, um, achieve uh, successfully achieve it, we need a collaboration and coordination between people who involve. It is common to stroke or COVID or whatever. We need collaboration and coordination. So we need, if there are different people who are involved in the process, there has to be a good communication. That's multidisciplinary team among the multidisciplinary team. The habit of constant discussions about patients and continuous in information exchange. 
during the management process. So that is why communication is so important. And coordination, again, to facilitate the efficient group work based on structured plans. So communication and coordination is the key in multidisciplinary care. So multidisciplinary team, they, there is a mechanism for organizing and coordinating health and care services to meet the needs of an individual with complex care needs. Uh, where we bring together the expertise and skills of different professionals to assess, plan, and manage, manage the care plan jointly. So that is why we need a multidisciplinary care team, a multidisciplinary approach for um, different health uh, issues. Then why do we need multidisciplinary care approach for stroke? Because as I mentioned earlier, stroke has a different complex disabilities and care needs. So if the care needs and disabilities are complex, we need different people to involve. The teams involved are larger than normal other health conditions, more compared to um, many other health conditions. Stroke is a one condition where we need a lot of uh, different uh, professionals involved in providing the care. So team members perform activities toward a common goal. So all of them should have a coordinated and collaborated mechanism to provide this care and perform activities towards a common goal. So in, a, in uh, apart from that, there will be added responsibility of the group on behalf of the patient. It's not a single individual responsibility, it's a common responsibility. So all these uh, advantages are with this multidisciplinary care approach. So if you look at stroke multidisciplinary team, there will be a rehab physician, a neurologist, physician, a rehabilitation consultant, whoever is leading the process and coordinating and look after medical problems. There has to be a nurse who's looking after basic ward care and nursing issues with the patient. Physiotherapist, rest of physical function, movement, balance, and coordination. Occupation therapist, again, motor, sensory, cognitive impairments, and activities of daily living are focusing mainly. Speech therapist, improve language and communication, other than, uh, and uh, swallowing as well. Psychologist, psychological, emotional, and cognitive issues. There has to be a social worker looking after socioeconomical issues and discharge plans. Dietitian or nutritionist to improve or focus on nutritional issues. So there will be, there are many other people who can involve in different uh, levels of uh, stroke care uh, plan. So the team is big and they have specific roles. So we need a coordinated method. And there will be some overlaps between uh, different care providers. It doesn't matter. Finally, we are targeting a common goal. So stroke rehabilitation process is it's predominantly based on this multidisciplinary care approach. So what are the benefits of multidisciplinary care approach? Benefits for the patient as well as for the healthcare professional. So improved health outcome is the key, both the functional outcome as well as the mortality improvement with multidisciplinary approach. There's enough evidence to show that both functional outcome and um, mortality will improve if we provide a multidisciplinary care approach for stroke uh, rehabilitation. And apart from that, they, the patients and the clients get more satisfaction when they get more inputs oriented, uh, goal oriented um, inputs and uh, more efficient with the resources, whatever the resources available, we can use them more efficiently. So this is another advantage of a uh, multidisciplinary approach and it will enhance the job satisfaction of the team members, sharing knowledge, skills, and uh, focusing all of them towards a uh, one, particular goal. So it gives uh, you as a professional a 
job satisfaction when you see the achievement of goals. So finally, what we really need is a change of attitude. Stroke, as you all know, it's a preventable disease. It is treatable, treatable with thrombolysis, thrombectomy, and various acute methods. And it is more importantly rehabilitable. The patients will finally, uh, after all, they will have a lot of disabilities, but we can achieve uh, independence and good quality of life with rehabilitation. So it is preventable, treatable, and rehabilitable. The key thing is teamwork. That is a key to success. So we have to plan together, work together, and achieve a common goal together. So I will stop here about giving an overview about uh, multidisciplinary care approach and rehabilitation. The rest of the nursing, therapist, and they all will give you a more practical approach how to conduct stroke rehabilitation program and how to set up acute stroke unit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Champika Gunawardhanan, for that extra uh, comprehensive uh, uh, presentation uh, on um, multidisciplinary team care. Uh, if there are any that uh, who would uh, wish to uh, uh, question Dr. Champika Gunawardhanan, it's the time for you now. You could raise your hand. But Champika, could you just uh, tell uh, sort of uh, how how uh, we should as a country that uh, we should move forward in establishing multidisciplinary team here um, in practice. Yeah, madam, if you, you now we see a lot of uh, many centers. We have uh, stroke care uh, uh, rehabilitation programs running with multidisciplinary support, but to establish it in a in a, in a widespread, we need first the manpower, and especially we need all these uh, adequate number of professionals involved in uh, various uh, prov provision of various um, uh, support. And uh, if we have the manpower, if we have a dedicated and interest, then I think we can obviously start up. Uh, uh, rehabilitation programs, even with uh, very small level. Uh, main thing, I think, the interest and attitude. If we have it, we can start. Yeah. So I think that uh, uh, there aren't questions from the uh, audience. Let me uh, show my appreciation to Dr. Champil Gunawadana for his contribution. He actually has contributed to the book, Zoom Lectures, as well as here for the workshop. So by awarding him with this certificate that is awarded by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, so as I told you, initially organizing this type of a program is not an easy task, it involves many aspects. So there are two other key features uh, who, are, uh, who, who are one of the vice presidents and the academic chair, Professor Sudarshini Vasalatantri, and also Dr. Chapuri Suravir, who have been behind organizing this program and have put so much of an effort. Uh, let me make use of this opportunity to thank both of them for their contribution to make this a success and uh, also to call Dr. Chaturi Suravira to chair this uh, uh, program from this point onwards, Chaturi. Thank you very much, Madam, and good morning to all of you again. So the next session uh, in the program is Nursing for Stroke Care, which will be conducted by Mrs. D. Tushari Anuruddhika, the clinical tutor of NHSL, as well as she is a nursing officer attached to National Hospital of Sri Lanka. And additional input to this presentation was by Ms. Sujata Seneviratna, the senior lecturer of Department of Nursing and Midwifery. Faculty of Allied Health Sciences of University of Sri Jayawardenepura. Good morning, all of you. 
Firstly, I would say thanks uh, to SLMA for offering me this valuable opportunity. I'm going to discuss the nursing care for stroke. As multidisciplinary team member in the stroke rehabilitation team, the nurses play a vital role, a key role for patients recovery. And according to the International Council of Nurses, whatever the function a nurse does falls into four fundamental responsibilities. They are promotion of health, prevention of illness, restoration of health, and alleviation of suffering. From the, uh, within the next 30 minutes, we will discuss the delivery of safe, competent, and ethical care for stroke patients. Care is always individualized. Therefore, at the onset of a stroke or on the admission of a stroke patient, nurse has to assess the patient's cognitive and psychological functions, including patient's background, means the education level, the occupation, socioeconomic level, and the habits as well. Here, I'm discuss, I will discuss the nursing care under two aspects. The first one is physical care, and next, the psychological or emotional care. Regarding the physical care, I will discuss uh, physical care under several topics. They are preparation of the patient's environment, monitoring the patient, maintenance of skin integrity, maintenance of positioning, maintaining nutrition as well as fluid balance, bladder and bowel continence, measures to prevent complications and supporting rehabilitation. As the first part of the physical care, it is an important function of stroke nursing. A stroke unit or the stroke patient's environment should be with minimal environmental hazards, such as low noise levels without harsh sounds, sufficient lighting and sufficient ventilation, keeping minimal number of objects in the environment, and we have to maintain the environment without bad orders. And we have to keep the floor as a dry, clean, and without insects. We can keep a wall clock or day calendar and wall hangers also. And patient's unit should be consisted with a bed, uh, a safe bed with railings or adjustable bed. At least the bed should have uh, the facilities to elevate head in. Uh, we have to keep a locker or bedside cupboard for patient's use and bed table and an armchair. We have to keep at least three to 3.5 feet in between two beds of stock patients. And easy access to the bathroom is very essential. We have to keep a sucker machine, oxygen and pulse oximeter or multi-monitor for further use uh, when necessary. And uh, the next physical care aspect is, now I'm discussing the physical aspect of patient care. The next physical care aspect is monitoring the patient. The nurse has to assess the patient's ARV patency. When necessary, we have to suck out secretions, we have to administer oxygen, we have to insert an ARV to maintain patent ARV. And all the time, nurse has to observe the patient very closely. We have to observe patient's temperature, blood pressure, pulse rate, 
saturation of oxygen levels, pupils, capillary blood sugar levels uh, also. And observation of GCS and maintenance of GCS chart, Glasgow Coma Scale is, uh, it helps the nurse to know the conscious level. And we can keep documentation uh, to monitor intake and output, bowel and bladder uh, function, and pressure ulcer chart also. While monitoring, if we detect any kind of deterioration, we have to inform the medical officer and we have to take necessary timely ex actions uh, because it is very important for patients' early recovery. The next physical aspect is prevention of pressure ulcers. These are the, these are the, uh, sorry. These are the common sites of pressure ulcers. Back of the head, shoulder, ear, elbow, hip, buttocks, thigh, leg, heel, toes, and rib cage are the more common sites of pressure sores. The next physical aspect of KI is prevention of pressure ulcers. Bed linen, clean, we have to maintain bed linen clean and dry without creases. And we have to use the patient's clothing without pins and buttons. And we have to clean the skin and keep the skin dry, massaging pressure points. And uh, if necessary, we have to use pressure relieving devices. Turning positions once in two hours helps to prevent pressure ulcers. When patient moves, it, does, it shouldn't apply shearing force or frictions. We can use a standard position maintain chart uh, in the unit for patient's uh, benefit. Positioning is the next physical care aspect. Two hourly position changing, major position changing. And at any time, minor position changing is very necessary. We can uh, do minor position changing for head, arms, and legs uh, in between uh, two hour period period of major position change. We can keep the stroke patient in sideline position on affected and unaffected side, lying on back and sitting up position. These figures show uh, lying on affected side, lying on unaffected side and lying on patient's back or sitting up positions. The next physical care aspect is maintenance of nutrition and fluid balance. Here, we have to assess the patient's nutritional status, especially on admission through physical appearance and through blood investigations such as full blood count, serum electrolytes, serum protein levels, serum cholesterol levels, etc. And nurses assess the ability of saline before giving anything orally. If patient is able to take orally, it's that the problem is very minimal and we can maintain nutrition with close care. If it is unable to take orally, we have to insert a NG tube. Insertion of a NG tube must be done by a skillful nurse. During this, uh, we have to prevent trauma to nasal and esophageal mucosa. We, before insertion, we have to inform the patient. We have to take, if, if it is able, we can take the consent of the patient. We have to position the patient in sitting up or at least 30 degrees elevated from the head inside. And, we have to take the proper measurement of the NG tube before insertion. 
and we have to after insertion we have to pass in the tube to the nostril and check in the placement of tube and retain contents are very important we can give 300 to 350 milliliters per meal and six meals per day six meals per day uh, through the ng tube uh, then we can fulfill the nutrition and fluid balance requirements. The dietitians will help to decide the variety of food items to deliver the patient. These are some images uh, which shows uh, the position we have to maintain while inserting a NG tube and uh, how to measure the NG tube uh, before insertion and checking retained feeds uh, after insertion of the NG tube or before giving any meal to the NG. Then bladder and bowel continence uh, is the next physical aspect of care. Main, bladder and bowel continence maintenance is the next physical care aspect because we have to care the patient to avoid constipation. For that, we can provide high fiber intake diet and we have to maintain adequate fluid intake about two, two to three liters per day. The history of patient's bowel habit from the assessment of admission helps to establish regular time of toileting. We have to keep daily nurses notes to refer by the other multidisciplinary care members and if the bowels are not opening we can insert suppositories we can use stool softeners or any mask uh, to relieve the discomfort of the pain of the patient and urinary continence wise initially we have to assess the ability of passing urine If patient is unable to pass urine, means if patient is having urinary retention or urinary incontinence, we have to insert a urinary catheter. It is important to remove it as soon as possible. Use of appropriate size and insertion under highly aseptic techniques is a must and providing adequate fluid intake, securing the catheter to the thigh and maintenance of intake output charts as well as temperature chart includes in urinary care. Up to now, I have discussed the physical aspect of nursing care. Now, I'm going to discuss uh, the emotional and psychological aspect of care. Understanding the emotional instability of the patient on admission and throughout the Rehabilitation process is a must uh, to be done by a nurse. We have to take proper measures to relieve pains and worries and psychological disturbances. Then it will help to reduce patient's anxiety and depression. And we can keep a care or bystander with the patient whom the patient prefers. And we can encourage the patient, admiring the patient about his or her daily gains during the rehabilitation and the recovery. It is very important in psychological care. Now, uh, the main name of this uh, SLMA workshop program is to establish uh, stroke units in uh, all over the country. So, the preparedness of uh, nurses uh, to deliver proper nursing care for stroke patient is essential part uh, to be done. So uh, all the nurses, they have to uh, have good understanding of the neurological basis of stroke. So uh, we can conduct uh, workshops and uh, ongoing education programs for nurses to uh, raise their knowledge levels regarding stroke care and skills we have to 
develop the skills in appropriate communication with patient and the family and the multidisciplinary team members and nurses have to know well about the patient how the patient perceives and responds to the environmental stimuli and ability to understand verbal and nonverbal responses of the patient and evaluate the responses uh, is very necessary when we are uh, rendering nursing care uh, the skills in documentation is essential to pass the messages regarding the patient uh, to the multidisciplinary team members and nurses have to support for rehabilitation from the admission of the patient uh, up to the maximum recovery of the patient and nurses will coordinate the multidisciplinary team members and nurses have to educate the family as well as the patient and the carers and nurses have to encourage the patient and carer to continue the prescribed exercises for maximal recovery we have to give continuous psychological support uh, during the rehabilitation process and preparation for home care uh, is very necessary for uh, patients maximum recovery skill Uh, we have to improve the skills uh, of the family members or carers mostly when the patients are discharging with disabilities and we have to explain the patient's emotional status and psychological support about uh, for the uh, for the family members and how to bear the patient's emotional uh, changes how to understand how to identify how to respond for those emotional instabilities and health advices on continuum medications is important and we have to inform the safety measures uh, to avoid patients from uh, unsafe environments and we have to give information about follow up care and rehabilitation uh, according to the patient's needs and the family needs so uh, these are the things i have discussed uh, regarding the physical care and the psychological or emotional care regarding the stroke nursing uh, stroke nursing part so i am going to wind up my session thank you all for all of you thank you thank you and uh, now if there are any questions you can um, post them on chat or ask miss tushari uh, he, she is available here and i see that uh, uh, miss senaviratna is also available online will she will you be able to take questions as well mrs senaviratna is the other resource person of for course. thank you very much yes Right. Yeah. Any questions from those who are joining online or who are here? Right. In the absence of any questions, thank you very much, Mrs. Anurudhika, as well as Mrs. Senaviratna, who was joining online. And can I cordially invite um, Madam Padma Gunaratna to uh, hand over the certificate? the next um, topic is physiotherapy for stroke and dr nadisha kalyani the lecturer in physiotherapy from the department of allied health sciences faculty of medicine colombo and mr b a p lakmar physiotherapist from national hospital of sri lanka colombo are the um, resource persons for this particular topic and first um, we have dr nadisha kalyani Uh, and um, it will be aired as a video good morning everyone the topic of my presentation is physiotherapy for stroke i am dr nadisha kalyani a lecturer attached to the department of allied health sciences 
Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. What is a stroke? As you may already know, it is a rapidly developed clinical sign of a focal disturbance of cerebral function of presumed vascular origin. And the commonest presentation of, of a stroke is hemiplegia, which is defined as the loss of voluntary movement with alteration of muscle tone and sensation throughout one side of the body due to a damage or a lesion to the opposite side of the brain or upper side of the spinal cord. Under clinical man manifestation, there are, num there are a number of clinical signs uh, uh, presented in stroke patients, uh, which are sensory and motor symptoms, spasticity, synergy, reflexes, associated reactions, impaired higher cerebral function, speech and language disorders, dysphagia, bladder and bowel impairment, and sexual dysfunction. As physiotherapists, we carry out a comprehensive assessment for stroke patients. This starts with a subjective assessment. Under personal information, we get the name of the patient, age, sex, address, occupation, marital status, position in the family, etc. And also the history of present complaints, present complaints, past medical, surgical history, such as hypertension, seizures, cholesterol, whether the patient is on any drugs, and then medical investigations such as CT or MRI in the brain, echo, and then the uh, medical and surgical diagnosis. Under objective assessment, we start with the observation. We observe the skin color, skin texture, build of the patient, scar tissues, muscle wasting, fasciculation, the general attitude, and the posture. This is the typical, typical hemiplegic posture, as you have already seen. And uh, as physiotherapists, this is very important for us, the observation of the posture. So, uh, according to the regions of the body, we assess the posture uh, of the patient. And usually, the head, the head and trunk, the head is flexed to affected side and rotated to the opposite side. Trunk is elongated to unaffected side. And in the upper limb, the shoulder girdle is retracted and depressed. The shoulder is adducted and medial rotated. The elbow is flexed, the wrist is flexed, the hand, thumb adducted and flexed, fingers flexed and curved, and in the lower limb, the pelvic girdle is retracted, the hip is extended and lateral rotated, knee is extended, ankle plantar flexed and curved, and the foot is curved. The gait analysis is also important as physiotherapists. Um, so in a patient uh, with hemiplegia, uh, in the ankle joint, the early stance phase, the heel strike is missing. This is due to the pronounced inversion. Due to the pronounced inversion, the weight comes on the lateral aspect of the foot. And in the mid stance, there's no dorsiflexion, the forward shift of the body weight is prevented due to this. In the late stance phase, the knee does not flex due to lack of dorsiflexion. And in the knee joint, the initial knee flexion does not occur. Knee remains in hyperextension. And in the late stance phase, no knee flexion is presented. The affected leg move forward by compensatory mechanism. In the hip joint, 
in the stance phase, in the early and mid stance phases, the affected leg is placed very close to the normal limb and sometimes cross it due to high adduction. In the late stance phase, the hip adduction is prominent. And during the swing phase, the limb moves forward in a very slow manner. Hip and knee flexion is absent. There is plant flexion of ankle and retraction of the pelvis. And again, under objective assessment, we palpate the patient. We assess the warmth, tenderness, edema, and muscle tone. There are a number of tests that we use to assess different aspects, including the motor examination, muscle tone, sensory examination, reflex testing, balance, coordination, assessment of cranial nerves, level of consciousness, higher cerebral functions, respiratory system, grip strength, pain, and independence of self-care. Under motor examination, we assess the tone, the muscle tone. Uh, this is tested by uh, fast passive movement to determine the distribution of the spasticity. And mainly the modified Usher scale is used to measure the muscle tone, the spasticity. And under muscle testing, the voluntary control of testing is used which is, grade, which is graded from grade uh, zero to grade six. The grade zero is no contraction or flicker of contraction. And the grade six is full range of motion in isolation against resistance. Under sensory examination, the superficial sensation is assessed, the fine touch and pain. And under deep sensation, the vibration and crude touch under cortical sensation, the two-point discrimination, stereognosis, and proprioception. This is tested bilaterally on, uh, in the upper limbs and lower limbs. Under reflex testing, the deep tendon jerks are tested, the biceps reflex, brachioradialis reflex, ex extensor digitorum reflex, triceps reflex, knee jerk, and ankle reflex. Under superficial tendon jerks, the Babinski reflex and the abdominal reflex tested. Moving on to the balance assessment, which is very important. The main uh, areas which I assess are the sitting and standing balance, especially the static sitting balance and dynamic sitting balance, and then static standing balance and dynamic standing balance. The Berg balance scale is mainly used in assessing balance. And uh, these are the uh, aspects which are tested, such as sitting to standing, sitting unsupported, standing unsupported, standing to sitting, transferring, etc. Under coordination, the finger nose test is used and heel knee test is used. Uh, to measure different aspects of coordination. Then uh, the cranial nerves are assessed and the level of consciousness can be assessed using the GCS. Under higher cerebral function, the memory, cognition, speech and hearing the fine movements are tested. Measuring the respiratory function is also important. We measure the chest expansion. So the measurements are taken at three points at the level of axilla, siphoid process, and the 10th costal cartilage. These measurements are taken at resting, expiration, inspiration, and then we can measure the chest expansion. Also, the status of the uh, chest is uh, assessed using the vibration and percussion methods. The grip strength is also measured. 
uh, and there are different type of uh, grips that are tested in stroke patients. The wrist control, hook grasp, lateral grasp, cylindrical grasp, index thumb, spherical grasp. So there are different type of grasps, grasps uh, uh, tested in these patients. The pain is also assessed using the numerical pain scale. And then the independence of self-care using the Barthel index, which is a widely uh, used scale for uh, stroke patients with excellent validity and reliability. And then the functional independence measure, which is also widely used for stroke patients. Moving on to the uh, physiotherapy management of uh, stroke patients. First, the acute stage. These are the uh, main aims uh, during the acute stage. Positioning, preventing pressure sores, improve respiratory and circulatory function, and prevent from deconditioning. The position, position of the bed in the uh, room or the ward setup is very important. Uh, all these stimulus are brought from the affected side of the patient in order to encourage the patient using the affected side. And then the positioning is very important. And this is how the patient is positioned, firstly on the affected side, and then on the non-affected side. And this is how the patient is positioned in supine. Here, the adequate support is provided using pillows to the affected upper limb, trunk, and lower limb. Improving respiratory and circulatory function is vital. For this, breathing exercises are performed, chest expansion exercises, huffing and coughing techniques are performed, as well as passive and active ankle and toe exercises. To prevent from deconditioning, early immobilization is mobilization in bed is done, early propped up positioning, sitting, and then later to standing. Moving around the bed and facilitate movement of functioning of the limbs. So these are um, some of the uh, exercises performed to mobilize the trunk and the arm. In the first picture, you can see how the elongation of the trunk is performed using passive stretching techniques. And then the second picture, the elevation of the arm is performed. <coughs> and the affected leg is also mobilized. The hip and knee flexion over the side of the bed. This is mostly done passively by the physiotherapist. Moving on to the post-acute stage, Generally, uh, the recovery of function is fastest up to three months following the onset of a stroke, uh, with, uh, with a significant recovery occurring up to six months, while some patients continue to recover function up to one year. Therefore, uh, physiotherapists treat uh, stroke patients for varying lengths of time. And during the post-acute stage, uh, Usually, the uh, five days a week for a minimum of, minimum of three hours of active rehabilitation per day is recommended. So these are the aims during the uh, during this phase: improve movement control, gait training, improve sensory function, improve balance, improve strength, and manage spasticity. <coughs> Improving the movement control 
two uh, type of techniques are used, the neurophysiological techniques and motor relearning techniques. These neurophysiological techniques, usually the physiotherapist uh, support uh, the correct patterns acting as the decision maker for movements. So the patient is relatively a passive re recipient. Uh, so this can be passive or active assisted. <clears throat> the motor relearning techniques mostly use active patient involvement with the intention to perform the task, practicing and having feedback. Under neurophysiological techniques, the proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation techniques are very important, which we call the PNF techniques. These are based on diagonal patterns of movement and uh, we apply a variety of stimuli such as visual, auditory, or proprioceptive uh, stimuli to achieve normalized movements. These are the movements for the upper extremity, the upper extremity PNF patterns. These are mostly done uh, passively or active assisted movements, but this can be done as active movement, movements as well. Uh, so, we, so there are four types, D1, D2, D, and D1 flexion, D2 flexion, D2, D1 extension, and D2 extension. Moving on to the upper extremity PNF patterns, again, four types, D1 and D2 flexion, uh, D1 and D2 extension. So all these are diagonal movement patterns. Here, the physiotherapist commands the patient so the patient can think about the movement happening. So it facilitates the re-education of the movement patterns. The motor relearning techniques are performed in lying, sitting and standing. So these are some of the activities in lying, rolling on the affected side, rolling on the non-affected non side. And then again, bridging with rotation of the pelvis and bridging on affected side. Then the activities in sitting, the self-assisted arm, arm movements are performed using the non-affected upper extremity. There are a number of activities in standing. So this is one of these activities, which is stepping. Uh, how, so this is how the physiotherapy, physiotherapist assists in stepping uh, for this stroke patient. Then again, apart from these traditional methods, uh, the repetitive task training is also commonly used nowadays. This is the active practice of task-specific motor activities, focusing on improving function of the hemiplegic arm or the leg through repeated activity practicing. So the, some of the activities are repeatedly practiced. And again, the constraint-induced movement therapy. This is inducing the patient to use the more impaired upper extremity for many hours of the day. This involves restricting the contralateral arm in a sling and training the affected arm. Gait training plays a vital role in this rehabilitation process. So the physiotherapist use different walking aids and orthotics in order to facilitate this gait training. Apart from the above uh, methods, uh, in order to improve the sensory, the sensory function, the presentation of repeated sensory stimuli, and then stretching, stroking, superficial and deep pressure, an application of icing and vibration is used. In order to improve the balance, facilitating the symmetrical weight bearing, postural perturbations, 
preaching activities and dual task training is performed in order to improve the strength strengthening agonist and antagonist muscles graded exercises using free weights sandbags and isokinetic devices are used and managing spasticity is also very important sustained stretch and slow icing of spastic muscle is used rhythmic rotations and slow rocking movements positioning in anti synergistic patterns are used finally the role of the physiotherapy in uh, stroke rehabilitation is very important uh, as a as uh, part of the healthcare team the physiotherapist plays a vital role in the recovery of uh, physical function of the stroke survivors so uh, in fact the early mobilization functional training by the physiotherapist is considered most important especially in the acute care and uh, since uh, the recovery may continue for many years after stroke the long term the long term care is also vital not only uh, the patient but also uh, the large proportion of physiotherapist time is spent in educating advising and uh, training the relatives and other carers therefore i would say the um, physiotherapist plays a vital role in the multidisciplinary team in management of stroke patients thank you thank you very much dr nadisha i don't think she is uh, dr nadisha is available online uh, so um, if there are any uh, questions you can uh, post the questions to dr nadisha kalyani before i introduce mr bap lakmar right um, in the absence of any questions i am moving on to the next session of the physiotherapy for stroke may i invite mr b a p lakmar the physiotherapist of national hospital of sri lanka subodaya sanat sildha ladam me api practical session ekata ma yanna hadanne ah enna apita inno rogi මෙතුම මිච්ච සමරසිංහ මේ එතුමගේ දකුණු අත පැත්තේ අංශ භාග තත්යක් තියෙන දැනට අපි බලමු එතුම දැන් මේ ස්ට්‍රෝක් යුනිට් එකේ ඉන්නේ දැන් දකුණු අත පැත්තේ අංශ භාග තත්යක් තියෙන කොට එතුමගේ මේ හැම දිනෙම ලං වෙන්න ඕනේ ට්‍රීට්මන්ට් කරන අය තෙරපිස්ලා සියලු දෙනාම ලං වෙන්න ඕනේ යට දකුණු අත පැත්තෙන් පමණයි उदाहरण खरीन प्रसेंटेशन ने कहते बोल देखा मैं टिपिकल स्पेसिफिक पैटर्न ने कहा पेन हुआ ये टिपिकल स्पेसिफिक पैटर्न ने के शोल्डर 
elbow extension, finger extension and position. Api from the one known as supine position. Ilan Karne, a patient good at the neck by eye, may stroke a hand to get a in a position, the key patient on the one. Ekatamai stroke patient to save my position. It's a putter, uh, yeah, the wooded in a position, Nick, unsafe. It ekata hate to stroke side to good at a water passive, a shoulder, a leg hip picker. Ever to support taker or do it. Abi Balam Kohon the position. May I must have the sound side take the mouth at the end? At the footer, Yagi trunk kicker may wood at the end of muscle strong. Trunk kicker may have a curve in the chance of the neck. Enisa stability of the end. Enisa may other support give him a much of the end. Backward roll in a can of a thunder below a catino. Near the support ten. Echerea was showing. Right, up in may May shoulder can stable. May pet the trunk kicker support the run in a hand. A trunk curve in a possibility of the no. In Sanivari make a support the run. May lower limb becker keep picking unstable. In Sa below a cathedral support the run. Upi Hadanam may lamba is fine like a curve in a canamatan. Methin the lamba pillow ko kuch kya no right. lamba pillow ka tin ki lagat kama tamay. Ega tibbe nattang ape trunk muscle, let lattice muscle, dosa muscle, like spasticity. It was a trunk ek adavin tapte nirmane. Right. Chutta ke hatam. Ita pas me me. Mam penna dosa karan na ape karne exercise ki pya. Palamuin me me. May shoulder muscles are prevention again of Balando. It in the uh, a way uh, shoulder muscles, girdle muscle, muscle welcome, massage jaga kitam weather. May you get friction massage jaga capita carana polong? All area I get.
ඒකෙදි මසල්ස් වලට නියුට්‍රිෂන් ලැබෙනවා ඒ නියුට්‍රිෂන් එක්ක ඒකේ පැවැත්ම ආරක්ෂා කරගන්න අපිට පුළුවන් ඒ සමතරව අපි එක්සයිසස් කරවන්න ඕනේ ෂෝල්ඩර් ජොයින්ට් එකට මේ විදියට හැමතිස්සෙම මේ එක්සයිස් වලදී අපි යූස් කරන්න ඕන ටච් කරන්න එක්ස්ටෙන්සර් සර්ෆස් ෆ්ලෙක්සර් සර්ෆස් භාවිත කරලා කරවොත් එක්සයිසස් ටිපිකල් පැටර්න් ඩෙවලොප් වීම චාන්ස් එක වැඩි ආකාරයට එල්බෝ එක්ස්ටෙන්ෂන් කරවන්න පුළුවන් ඒකෙදී අපි එක්ස්ටෙන්ෂන් එක විතරයි patient ගේ encourage කරන්න අපි patient advise කරන්නේ නැහැ flexion එක කරන්න අපි flexion එක කරලා අත දිගාරින් අත දිගාරින් ඒ ආකාරයෙන් ලිලා උනන්දු කරන්නේ එක්ස්ටෙන්ෂන් fingers වලදිත් එහෙම उत्साह මේ වගේ ප්ලාන්ටර් සර්ෆස් අල්ලන්නේ නැතුව තමයි එක්සයිස් කර පාත දාන්න දැන් මේක උස්සලා ගන්න උස්සන්න රයිට් දැන් දිගාරි කකුල නමන්න දැන් මේක පාත දාන්න උස්සලා උඩට ගන්න උස්සලා ගන්න ඔයා කරින් කමාන්ඩ් කරන්න මේ پیشنට ස්ට්‍රෝක් پیشنට කෙනෙකුට කමාන්ඩ් කිරීම ඉතාම වැදගත් ඒ කමාන්ඩ් එකට තමයි යාගේ බ්‍රේන් එක යාගේ ඇටෙන්ෂන් එක මෙතෙක් යොමු කරන්න. අපි මේ කරන එක්සයිස් එකේ ප්‍රයෝජනේ මෙහෙම නවන්න කියලා කමාන්ඩ් කළාම ඒක යාගේ කණින් යා අහනවා. ඊට අමතරව අපි මේක නවනකොට මසල්ස් වල ඇති වෙන ස්ට්‍රෙච් ප්‍රිසෙප්ෂන් එක යාගේ ස්පයිනල් කෝඩ් එක හරහා බ්‍රේන් එකට ඩිමාන්ඩ් එකක් ගොඩ නගන්න. මේක කන්ට්‍රෝල් කරන්න. ඒ ඩිමාන්ඩ් එක මත තමයි නියුරෝ ප්ලාසිටි ඩෙවලොප් වෙන්නේ. එතකොට patient ගේ විෂුවල් යා යා හොඳට මේ පැත්ත බලන්න. ඒ වගේම මේ කියන දේ යහගෙන ඉන්න ඕනේ. එයා mentally මේක ගැන ලොකු විශ්වාසයක් තියෙනවා. මේක අපිත් එක්ක කරන්න ඕනේ. right. මේක ඇදලා ගන්න කකුල නවන්න. දැන් මේක බීම දාමු උසල උඩට ගන්න. උසල ගන්න. දැන් දිගාරින්. आई ना मरने, वो या करें कमांड कर रही थी, या अपित्त के इकट्ठे वैरी कर रही थी, आह या साइकोलॉजिकली होते दाते की नहीं हो, आह ये वाके में आह किन्हें दे तेरुंगे नहीं में है क्या भी युद्ध तो नहीं हो, ये में नौ नौ ते ए एक रिहैबिलिटेबल अवस्था वाले में, ये तो घोटा अभी रिहैबिलिटेशन के हम प्रमाण बेड के नर्दी में अभी मैं आप वेट बेहतर कराने पर दुकान आना हूँ एक अब ब्रीडिंग एक्सरसाइज़ पाव चिकन मैंने तो ये लोग कौन दे में दिन उड़े टूसन बड़ा हरी ही उड़े टूसन आना हाँ ताऊ उड़े टूसन पाठ करन उसन ऐसे में वार की एक्सरसाइज़ वाला आपकी ना क्लोज चेन एक्सरसाइज़ किया था डिस्टल लेंडे का मूव है ना डिस्टल लेंडे का मूव है ना तो मैं अतर में तो कुछ सुबह में मूव है उड़े टू सन आते थे उड़े टू मूव सन ना मैं मैं आ कर एक्सरसाइज़ वाले आप इधर बोलो आं स्पेसिफिकली डिवेलप हुई में इन तरह वे पेशेंट के एक्सरसाइज़ करा मुझे सामान्य एक्सरसाइज़ करा दी पेशेंट बाय इन करा मेक पेशेंट सिक्योर डिस्टल लेन देखा मूवी मार्क्स इतने भी नहीं हैं ऐने सा मेक इतनी स्पेसिफिकली डेवलप्ड भी में इतने चांस है का गुड़ा कर दो 
ස්ට්‍රෝක් පේෂන්ට් කෙනෙක්ගේ ස්පැසිටි ඩෙවලොප් නොකර එක්සර්සයිස් කරගෙන ඉන්න ඉතාම වැදගත්. හරි. ඊළඟට අපි බලමු පේෂන්ට් කෙනෙක් කොහොමද මේ ලයින් පොෂන් ඉඳලා සිටින් පොෂන් එකට ගන්න කියලා. අපි දැන් වාඩි වෙන්න යන්නේ. චුට්ටක් එහාට වෙන පළමුවෙන්ම හැරෙන්න අපි බලාපොරොත්තු වෙන්නේ හැරෙන්න අවශ්‍ය ඉඩ ලබා ගන්න පේෂන්ට් කියනවා එහාට වෙන්න කියලා. චුට්ටක් එහාට වුණා. දැන් මෙතන ඉඩ තියෙනවා. ඔයා මේ පැත්තට හැරෙන්න. මේ අත මට දෙන්න try. අපි දැන් නැගිටින්න යන නිසා ඇඟට යට වෙන හැරෙන්න යන නිසා ඇඟට යට වෙන්න තියෙන මේ අත අපි ඇත්තුවා. දැන් මේ කකුල නවල මේ පැත්තට හැරෙන්න. මේ සියලුම දේ කරන්නේ යාගේ වීක් සයිඩ් එකේ ඉඳලා. රයිට් අපි කකුල් දෙක පාතට දාමු. මේ අත පාවිච්චි කරන්න. ඔයාගේ හොඳ අත. මේ අතේ වැලමිට පාවිච්චි කරන්න. ඒක වැලමිට තද කරලා මේ අතේ හයියත් පාවිච්චි කරලා ඔයා ඉස්සෙන්න මම මෙහෙම් පාතර තල්ලුකු. එහෙම උදව් කරන්න මම ඔයා මේ අත පාවිච්චි කරන්න ඕනේ. පොඩ්ඩ පොඩ්ඩ මෙහෙම කියලා ඉස්සෙන්න උත්සාහ කරන්න ඕනේ. රයිට් ඔයාට බැරි වෙනකොට මම උදව් කරන්න. රයිට්. මේ විදිහට තමයි අපි යාව වාඩි කරන්නේ. රයිට්. මෙහෙම වාඩි කරගන්නට පස්සේ අපි පේෂන්ට් වල රඳවන්න ඕනේ සාමාන්‍ය මෙන්න මේ විදිහට. මේ පොසිෂන් එකේ අපි පේෂන්ට් තියලා මේ අතර වේට් පියා කරන්න පුරුදු කරන්න. මෙහෙම එල්බෝ එකට යන්නේ අද තියලා මේ විදිහට ක්‍රමානුකූල වේට් බෑ කරන අතට මේකත් අර කලින් කිව්ව විදියම ක්ලෝස් ටේන් එක්සයිස් ඩිස්ටල් එන්ඩ් එක මූව් වෙන්නේ නැහැ. මේ වේට් බෑ කිරීමෙන් ප්‍රයෝජන ගණනාවක් තියෙනවා. එකක් මේ මසල්ස් ඔක්කොම වේට් එක දරා ගන්න ඒ කියන්නේ ඇක්ෂන් එකක් සිද්ධ වෙනවා. මේ ෂෝල්ඩර් එකේ ප්‍රොපියෝසිට් එක මේ ඒ කියන්නේ ඒක ඩෙවලොප් වෙනවා ගොඩක් ඒ සෙන්සේෂන් එක ලබා ගන්න. ඒ සෙන්සේෂන් එකත් එක්ක බ්‍රේන් එක බ්‍රේන් එක ලොකු ඩිමාන්ඩ් එකක් ගොඩ නගිනවා මේ අත්ත ඇති වෙන මේ වේට් එකෙන් ඇති වෙන ඉම්පැක්ට් එක. එතකොට ඒකෙන් බ්‍රේන් එකට ඇති වෙන ඩිමාන්ඩ් එකත් එක්ක බ්‍රේන් එක හැමතිස්සෙම ලොකු අවශ්‍යතාව එක ලක්නව මේක කන්ට්‍රෝල් කරා. එතන මේ වේට් බෑරින් කියන එක ස්ට්‍රෝක් පේෂන්ට් කෙනෙක්ගේ රිහැබිලිටේෂන් එකේ වෙරි කී එක්සයිස් එකක්. බ්‍රිජින් අපලින් වේට් බෑරින් ලෝවර් වේට් ලිම් වේට් බෑරින් ඒ තරම් පොඩි ඉම්පෝටන්ට්. මේ විදිහට අපි කරවන්න පුළුවන්. ඒක සමහර අය ප්‍රැක්ටිස් කරනවා මේක මේ මේ අත සම්පූර්ණයෙන්ම මෙහෙම ඉස්සරහට තද කරලා ඒක බෝන් එකට බෝන් එක ලොක් වෙනවා එතකොට. ඒක ඇත්තෙන්ම ප්‍රයෝජනවත් දෙයක් නෙමෙයි බෝන් එක ත්‍රූ වේට් එක ගියා කියලා ඒකෙන් පේෂන්ට් බෙනිෆිට් එකක් නැහැ. ස්ලයිට්ලි පෙක්ස්පෝෂන් එක තමයි මසල් එකකට වේට් එක ඇප්ලයි වෙන්නේ. එතකොට අපි මේ වේට් බෑරින් කරන්න ඕනේ ස්ලයිට්ලි ප්ලෙක්ස්පෝෂන්. රයිට්. ඒ වගේම තව අපි මේ පේෂන්ට් බැලන්ස් ට්‍රේනින් කරවන්න ඕනේ. මේ විදිහට ඉස්සරහට පස්සට සිටින් පොසිෂන් එකේ බැලන්ස් ට්‍රේන් කරන්න ඕනේ. මෙතන තියෙන ට්‍රංක් රිප්ලෙක්සස් නෙක් රිප්ලෙක්සස් ඒවා ක්‍රියාත්මක වෙනවා. රයිට් ඔය ආකාරයෙන් ඊට පස්සේ සයිඩ් ටු සයිඩ් මූව් කළා. රයිට්. සමහර වෙලාවට ස්ට්‍රෝන් පේෂන්ට් කෙනෙක් නම් තරුණ පේෂන්ට් කෙනෙක් නම් යාගේ ස්කෙලිටල් ස්ට්‍රෙන්ත් එක ගැන අපිට විශ්වාස නම් අපි නෙක් එක ගැන විශ්වාසය තියන්න පුළුවන් තත් එක ඉන්නවා නම් නෙක් ටු ට්‍රංක් රිප්ලෙක්සස් ස්ට්‍රෝන් කරනවා. ඒ රිප්ලෙක්ස් සියල්ල ඇක්ටිවේට් කරන එක තුල එයාගේ බ්‍රේන් එක ගොඩ නගන්න අපි ඩිමාන්ඩ් එකක්. දැන් මේ ඒරියාස් කන්ට්‍රෝල් කරන්න පටන් ගන්න අවශ්‍ය වෙනවා ඉතින්. ඒකත් එක්ක තමයි නියුරෝප්ලාස්ටි ඩෙවලොප් වීමේ අවශ්‍යතාවය මතු වෙන්නේ. ඒකත් එක්ක ටික 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 මූමන්ට්ස් ඇති වීම තමයි අපි බලාපොරොත්තු වෙන්නේ. රයිට්. ඊට පස්සේ අපි මේ පේෂන්ට් දැන් ඉන්න බෙඩ් එකේ අපි ස්ටෑන්ඩින් පොස්ට් එකකට ගන්න ඕනේ. අපි සාමාන්‍ය නම් හොස්පිටල් එකේ යූස් කරනවා මේ 
क्लोथ रेप सपोर्ट करना बहिन्न हजार सपोर्ट करना सपोर्ट करना वीक एड्रेस पेशेंट पुटक बलपुरुद बल गूर्णिया अलगना उत्साह उलूकेटी 
बहुमत Thank you very much, uh, Lakmal. Lakmal have to wait for uh, for that uh, demonstration. That uh, I think definitely would be useful for your day to day uh, clinical practice, and particularly when you are seeing patients and to advise them uh, with regard to rehabilitation and of activities of daily living. Uh, so let me uh, show our appreciation to Lakmal by awarding his certificate for his presentation. Uh, our next speaker, or the next presentation, actually, uh, is uh, by again two uh, occupational therapists, uh, Mr. Nandana Vilage, Senior Tutor in Occupational Therapy, School of Physiotherapy and Occupational Therapy, Colombo, and uh, Mr. H. G. Tarindu Dilshan, Occupational Therapist, Neurology Unit, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. So, out of them, uh, Mr. Nandana Vilage would join us online. Uh, to make his presentation on occupational therapy. Nandan, over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. My presentation is about the role of occupational therapy for stroke. These are the contents of my presentation. First, I will briefly talk about what occupational therapy is followed by theoretical background of the profession and the processes. Then I will talk about the specific assessment used in occupational therapy for stroke rehab and interventions which encompasses prevention, restoration, compensation, and adaptation. Occupational therapy or OT in short is a client-centered approach concerned with promoting health and well-being of people of all ages with various physical and or mental illnesses through meaningful occupations. So meaningful occupations are the activities a person performs from the time of wake up in the morning until they retire to bed at night. Therefore, the primary goal of occupational therapist is to enable people to participate independently in the entire range of human occupations, ranging from activities of daily living to work and leisure. Right, uh, let me ask you to think why occupation are important to you. Think for about 30 seconds. Okay, let's uh, move to the next slide. So occupation is more than just a list of activities and also not just occupying you. Occupation has a deeper meaning than that. As we know, human being is an occupational being, meaning human cannot survive without engaging in activities. Occupation is a determinant of health. A Greek philosopher, Galen, said, Occupation is the nature's best physician and it is essential for human happiness. Occupation gives you a personal identity and a place in the society. For example, people recognize you from your engagement for living, such as a doctor, teacher, singer, occupational therapist, and so on. So occupation or engagement in activities provides control over the person's life and self-esteem. Mind the value of engaging in activities, occupational therapists believe that what people do affect their physical and mental well-being. Therefore, occupational therapists help people 
to carry out these meaningful activities which are restricted as a result of illness, disability or social exclusion and promote restoring the health and well-being of the person. When we look at the theoretical aspect, PEO model is the most popular model. This model is based on person, environment and occupation. According to this model, independent and best performance is dependent on three factors. That is factors related to the person, his or her living environment and occupation or engagement. So the performance such as activities of daily living, education, work and leisure is depend on factors related to the person. This includes the ability such as motor skills, processing skills, communication skills, etc. And best performance is also determined by the way that person perform occupation or engagement, such as habits, routines, roles, which are unique to the person. Finally, the environment in which the person engage in activity. This includes physical environment such as home or workplace and the social environment such as family members at the home or fellow workers at work. Yeah, sorry. Hence stroke can be can cause imbalance of these three areas. In this case, initially the aim of occupational therapies is to restore the abilities of the person. If the disability is irreversible, occupational therapist will change the way of engaging in occupation and also change the environment to enhance performance. Expansion of occupation and environment may help to overcome the deficiencies in person, which will in turn enhance the performance. To achieve those broad objectives, occupational therapists conduct assessment, then plan and carry out interventions and review the progress at the end of the program. Due to the complexity of the clinical picture of the person with stroke, a wide variety of specific tests are conducted. A wide variety of assessments are available in relation to assess body functions and structure, activities and participation, which are the components of the international classification of functioning. And uh, there was a detailed description about some of these uh, assessment by the previous speaker. However, in our context, this, all those assessments are not available uh, in occupational therapy units. After the detailed initial assessment, that OT intervention is planned. Major objective of occupational therapy are to prevent further complications and restore functions. If restoration is not possible due to permanent disabilities, coping skills and compensatory techniques are introduced to perform functions and also modify the patient's living environment to overcome limitations of performance. Let me discuss about the interventions. As, uh, pre as uh, previous lectures uh, shows, the correct positioning is essential at the early hypotonic stage to prevent pain, edema, subluxation, and dislocation of joint, and at the latter hypertonic stage to prevent the development of typical hemiplegic posture. It is important to maintain correct, correct posture initiated by our physiotherapy colleagues throughout the day as much as possible. So occupational therapists make sure the adherence of this correct body posture during activities of daily living. As we know that it is important that all members of the multidisciplinary team to encourage correct positioning. In the absence of treatment for complete cure for people following stroke, 
that rehabilitation is widely used to minimize impairment and maximize functions and thereby enhance quality of life. A wide range of therapy interventions are used to improve the upper extremity function after stroke. However, the most effective rehabilitation technique is yet to be identified. The type of intervention used will be determined by the needs of the patient. Here are some techniques that are widely used in stroke rehabilitation. And in occupational therapy, the treatment media is activities. So therefore, you can see the same treatment principle which was discussed by the physiotherapist is applied in occupational therapy using activities. So based on the assumption that symmetrical bilateral movements are movements activate similar neural networks in both hemispheres, promoting neural plasticity and cortical repair. Activities are designed for repetitive practice of bilateral arm movements in symmetrical and altering patterns. Activities are designed based on proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation techniques are practiced in regaining and maintaining of range of motion, muscle strength and power. PNF accelerates the response of neuromuscular activity through the stimulation of the proprioception. Another method is repetitive task practice. This method is based on the movement science and motor relearning theory, aimed to identify performance of the specific skills and teaching missing aspect of the skill using written, verbal, and visual instruction. These three methods, that is bilateral arm training, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, and repetitive task practice, are conventional treatment techniques, which are still widely in use. The constraint induced movement therapy or the CIMT is a more recently developed treatment technique. Dr. Edward Taub identified that the persistent weakness of the affected site is not because of the cortical injury itself, but due to the phenomenon called learn non-use in which person does not use affected site, which leads to muscle atrophy and corresponding weaknesses. And a good news is that this phenomena is reversible. CIMT comprised of forced use of paritic limb while restraining the contralateral unaffectedly. The previous interventions, bilateral training, the PNF, mirror therapy and constraint induced movement therapy are considered as bottom up techniques. The metaphor bottom up refers to the action path, according to which the movement of the effector located in the periphery stimulate the activity of the central nervous system. Among the approaches to the treatment of motor deficits after stroke, the bottom up techniques are most commonly used. Among them, CIMT and modified CIMT are strongly backed by research, therefore strongly recommended. In recent years, neuro rehabilitation has moved from bottom up to top down approach. During therapeutic activities, top down approaches are being used to stimulate the brain more directly, elicit neuroplasticity and enhance motor relearning. Mirror therapy is one such technique. Mirror therapy is a cognitive treatment method based on the neurological characteristics of the new mirror neurons. In mirror therapy, the affected side is covered behind a mirror and the unaffected side is seen through the mirror, as you see in this picture, which includes a visual illusion that activates the damaged brain area and provided a sense of normal movement in the affected site. Have you ever thought you can activate can your you brain now? by... Can you hear it now? Yes, we can now. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Have you ever thought you can activate your brain by just imagining doing a task? Neuroscientists using modern day scanning methods have revealed that when you imagine doing a task, it activates the similar brain areas that get activated when you are actually perform the task. This imagining, called mot imagery, is widely used by athletes and now is used for rehabilitating people affected due to conditions such as stroke. In mot imagery, the person mentally rehearses a specific task without actually attempting to do it. Adding together with the actual practice this technique has been found to be a simple cost effective and viable method compared to complex methods currently used for stroke rehabilitation there are two methods of mot imagery number one first person perspective that is imagining doing the task by self and number two third person perspective that is imagining as if being an observer of the person doing the task it is not known which imaginary perspective is better than the other so our study aim to determine the best perspective specific for improving upper limb functions after stroke. I have taken this video from a study that I was also involved. So motor imagery can be used in acute, subacute, and chronic stroke, and also for people with severe paralysis who cannot perform movement actively. And the good thing is motor imagery is non-invasive, cost-effective, viable method, which is easy to learn and can be practiced anywhere at any time without a supervision of a therapist. There is a recent evidence that both first person and third person motor imagery are equally effective in improving upper extremity function after stroke. In addition to the motor improvement, occupational therapist is involved in the restoration and compensation of wide variety of visual processing skills. Perceptual impairments such as body neglect, topographical disorientation, constructional and dressing apexias are also addressed by engaging in wide variety of activities. OT conducts sensory re-education using sensory training. If sensory loss is permanent, OT uses adaptive techniques to compensate the sensory impairment. When the restoration is not possible, occupational therapist focuses on compensatory techniques. Here the focus is to regain functions by compensating with the unaffected limb. This method is used to perform activities of daily living independently. When the disability is permanent, adaptation is necessary for carrying out activities of daily living and ensuring independence. Different types of assistive devices are designed and trained to use uh, in enhancing self-care activities such as feeding, drinking, you know, brushing, grooming, etc. Environmental modification is also conducted to remove barriers in the home and the work environment. Some of the common areas of concern are the non-slippery floors, poor lighting of the house, installation of commode sheets and grab bars, and also major alterations of the house, such as steps may need to be replaced with a ramp and widening the doorways, etc. When patient is independent in basic self-care activities, and if the patient is in the stage of earning, occupational therapist pay attention to resettle in the employment. To prepare for employment, similar activities are practiced at the OT unit. Occupational therapist liaises with the social service officer to find vocational training or apply for funds to start self-employment. Prior to discharge, ideally that occupational therapist visit the patient homes to provide recommendation to modify the home environment to suit the person's disability. Occupational therapist assess and train vehicle transferring skills and independent mobility at the home environment. Research shows that patient participation for decision making is more in the home environment than at the hospital setting and also 
patients adhere to the recommendations of the therapist more in the home. So uh, by sending the patient to home, it ends the occupational therapy process. In summary, occupational therapists use activity-based therapy to prevent complications and restoration of functions. When the disability is permanent, compensatory methods and adaptations are introduced to maximize the independence in activities of daily living, work, and leisure. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Nandana Velagi, uh, for that uh, uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation with regard to occupational therapy in stroke rehabilitation. If there are any questions, um, I'm sure that Nandana will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, in the absence of questions, uh, let me um, let me keep uh, uh, Nandan informed that there is a certificate uh, arranged to be awarded to Nandan and Tarindu for their commitment in organizing or for the contribution that he made to the book, the guide on stroke rehabilitation that will be published as a part of this uh, program. And also for this presentation. Thank you, Nandana. Thank you very much. The next presentation is on speech therapy, solving for stroke and solving for stroke. Uh, there are two resource personnel, Dr. Shamini Hetiarachi, Senior Lecturer, Department of Disability Studies, Faculty of Medicine, Raghana, and Mrs. Prabhani Dineshika, Senior Speech Therapist, the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mrs. Uh, Prabhani Dineshika uh, would make the presentation. Oh, Shamini, is it? All right, so uh, Dr. Chamini Hetiarachi, sorry, would make the presentation and much later there will be a practical demonstration by Mrs. Prabhani Dineshika. So Chamini, over to you. Uh, so we will, we will start with the uh, uh, practical program uh, component of the speech and solving assessment. Uh, so let me invite uh, Ms. Prabhani Dineshika to commence uh, her presentation so that uh, that would be followed by uh, uh, Dr. Chamini Hetiarachi's presentation. Thank you, Madam. Uh, I'm going to uh, conduct a um, screening assessment on dysphagia, a basic 5 ml water test. Uh, I'm going to conduct it with Ms. Mr. Samara Singh. Uh, Mr. Samara Singh, yeah, he's, the, he's my patient. And thank you very much, Mr. Samara Singh. Uh, for supporting us on this situation. So uh, first of all, I should uh, explain very ba basic points on uh, 5 ml water test. It's a um, very basic assessment on assessing uh, dysphagia. And usually in our bedside, it, we call it as a bedside devaluation also. So we usually do it with water. Warm, uh, warm water. We just need a, a cup, spoon, and a warm water to conduct this. Before giving anything, it's we should check his uh, solving uh, usual solving abilities and the other reflexes. Mister Samara Singh, matte poda kehala penda na wada. Nikang kehala penda na Mister Samara Singh. Tava tika khonda te kehala penda na. Hyundai. Uh, so you have to make sure whether he can uh, cough on command. Uh, otherwise, if, aspira if aspiration or call, so he might not be able to cough or so have to make sure before you give in anything, have to make sure whether he can pop up, your patient can perform a good productive cough. So 
uh, the other reflexes such as the tri solo and the laryngeal elevation also need to be reassessed. Uh, Mr. Samal Singh, Kela Gilela Pennanapu. So you this is just checking the dry solo. Uh, you can just we can just check this by uh, laryngeal elevation from three finger test or from the stethoscope. So if the patient is able to perform these two and also the other observable things like uh, if he's able to manage his own secretions and um, if if he's uh, the uh, secretions and the uh, breathing difficulties, if there is any observable signs, observable uh, aspiration signs, you should not perform this test further, this assessment further. But uh, if he's if the with co if the cough is there and the dry solo is there and you feel like he's able to manage his own secretions. And if there is no uh, risk of heavy pooling in the pharyngeal area, then you can go to the 5 ml water test. Okay. So what we usually do, we'll just give a uh, 5 ml water. We, uh, we usually, this spoon should be a 5 ml or less than it. More than it will be a uh, little dangerous because if the patient is get aspiration, it will be little dangerous. So make sure this is exactly 5 ml low, less than 5 ml. And uh, sometimes the patient, due to, uh, depend on his language abilities and all, sometimes the patient might not be able to uh, perform the dry solo and the other reflexes I check. So then you have to uh, make sure either you have to use a total communication or you have to stimulate the laryngeal elevation and check the um, reflexes. Mama made then a maturatika chutta gili na Mr. Samarasinha. Okay, so that's the first 5 ml we gave. Uh, and check for the aspiration signs, not only the cough, check for all the aspiration signs such as his breathing, any differences in breathing. Uh, you can check again with the stethoscope for the three finger test about his pharyngeal pooling. And uh, you can ask whether he's comfortable and um, check the laryngeal elevation. Again, while giving, the, uh, while giving the water, you can check the laryngeal elevation. So if everything is normal, then you can go for the second five. Mama Tava authority cup then I cut the in Mr. Samuel Singh. And while giving, you have to check the laryngeal elevation if there is anything abnormal in the sense like delay, unsteady, or something abnormal. You have to be careful before going to the third 5 ml. So if both okay, then uh, you can give the third 5 ml water. Man Tava authority cut then Mr. Samuel Singh. <laughs> ah, hurry, hurry. So for the third 5 ml, uh, there's a little bit of throat clearing you heard, which gives you a, a sign of a little aspiration, microaspiration. So the first he tolerated, second he tolerated, but for the third 5 ml, he had a small throat clearing there. So you have to keep in your mind. So there's a mild aspiration can be there, but you don't have to stop it here because other signs, I, I feel like uh, his breathing and everything is okay, then you can go to the next step also. In the stage, if his language is okay, in this stage, you can ask from the client how he feels. Hmm. Oh. Um. So then uh, if, he, if the signs are really bad, like if his breathing is really difficult and uh, when, while he's talking, if you feel his voice quality is really wet, then you don't have to go, give the, go to the next step. But if you feel all right, then you can offer the cup to drink. 
ඔයා මේ කෝප්පෙන් අරගෙන වතුර උගුරෙන් උගුර චුට්ට චුට්ට බොන්න විස්ට සමස්ස හරි හොඳට පහින්න ඔකේ සෝ he got cough for the cup drinking of water so obviously we can say he has uh, aspiration micro aspiration is there but you have to keep in mind for all patients they might not cough the patient who is with silent aspiration definitely they might not cough that's why we are assessing the cough reflex beforehand giving anything so uh, that mean he fails this test which does which does not mean that he can't take anything oral by now the only thing what we could say what we can say uh, he has to go for a alternative feeding method for the safety and adequacy but uh, even fail of this test because this is just it's just a pass fail test and does not say anything about oral feeds after this so uh even by failing this test um we can as i said earlier it, we can't say that he cannot take anything orally because there are further assessment to be to be done uh, most probably it will be discussed in the presentation as well this is just the bedside evaluation or the basic 5 ml water test i done then with the definitely he has to be inserted with the ng but then after inserting the ng we can further assess him with the food trial test and with the detailed solvin assessments uh, and if needed with the objective measurements like the barium solo study or the fee study so sometimes with the the next test the food trial test he might be able to take other food textures other than the water because the water has the high aspiration risk that's why we use usually water because it says that the all other consistencies are easy has less aspiration risk than water so may, we are trying so the next step we are trying with the other consistencies and sometimes he might be able to take other consistency consistencies but for water for adequate wa water or the liquid he has to continue with the ng and also if someone pass this test or if someone doesn't have any aspiration doesn't show any aspiration signs on this test does not say that he can take any everything orally so if someone pass basically says that the patient can continue oral feeds without uh, in alternative feeding method but if you like maybe in the next test with the other food textures he might be get aspirated so definitely the further assessment has to be done so it's just a test i what i actually want to say is just a test that to say whether alternative feeding method is need or not at this moment so definitely the further assessments has to be conducted if this test is passed or failed thank you mr samar singh thank you thank you very much uh, prabhani um the uh, the rest of the uh, presentation will be continued with uh, dr shamini hrachi uh, so over to you shamini uh, thank you madam uh, let me just pull up my slides to start with are you able to see the slides madam yes okay um so Good morning, everyone. My name is Shamini. Um, I'm a speech and language therapist by profession, and uh, currently I'm attached to the Department of Disability Studies at the University of Kalania. Um, this presentation was put together uh, by my colleague Saumya Ratnayake, who's also at the department, and uh, Prab uh, Prabhani Dineshika of the National Hospital, who. Um, 
very ably showed you uh, a demonstration of um, a, a screening assessment in dysphagia. So the talk today is titled Person-Centered Dysphagia and Communication Support at the Stroke Unit. I apologize for my inability to be with you physically like Prabhani uh, because my family is in the midst of COVID as, as I know many families in this country are. But I'm happy to take any comments you might have uh, using chat. So during this session, um, I, I hope to share some information on the central influence of the ICF framework on assessment and intervention, both in dysphagia management, as well as in communication skills management, and the centrality also of our work using an MDT approach, both to dysphagia management and communication skills management. And just a precautionary uh, consideration, Within the backdrop of COVID, really we are we have particular precautions that we need to uh, to take uh, because we are considered an at risk um, healthcare professional. Uh, we we work very closely both in dysphagia management and communication therapy um, with our clients. So due to the proximity and also because particularly in dysphagia assessment. Um, it's very unpredictable that one of our clients might cough. Um, and so because of the risk of aerosol generating procedures, we really do need to uh, take care of ourselves. And I, I, and I saw that um, Prabhani wa was taking precautions. So on a very personal note, and this is where the sort of personal becomes professional, my, my mom had a mild stroke in 2019, um, and that resulted in her requiring an NG inserted. Um, her speech was also, I mean, she had a few word finding difficulties, but the clarity of her speech was intact. And so here she is at home being cared for uh, with her very old and, um, one of her oldest companions, her cat, and very faithful companions who was with her right throughout her, her recovery. And I'm very thankful to everyone who supported my mom's care, including uh, Prabhani. And it is really because of an MDT effort that my mom is, is doing well today. So stroke care is very, very close to my heart. In terms of the guiding principles that we use, the, the framework that really um, underpins the work that we do as speech and language therapists, both in dysphagia and in communication therapy, it is the International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health proposed by the WHO, um, in, in short called the ICF framework. And for us in our work, this is really central. Um, it's central because we are moving from not just looking at the impairment, um, whether it is a swallowing difficulty or the lack of clarity when speaking, but looking more at what that the impact of that on the everyday life of people in terms of the activities that they limit and the participation that it restricts. So if we think about a stroke survivor, these are people who have had a life before the stroke, who have done amazing things with their lives, who have um, many, many roles that they play, whether it be as the head of the household, whether it be a, as a parent, uh, whether as a good neighbor, whether um, the CEO of a company maybe, or a work colleague, uh, perhaps as um, a congregation member of a church um, or a temple, an, an active, politically active person, or a, a generally wonderful citizen. And I'm reminded of one of the clients that I met when I was training in the UK as a student, 
And this was a stroke survivor who had been to the Olympics as part of the archery team. And there he was with this amazing life story and in front of me, a 20 something uh, student and unable to recall his partner's name and unable to tell me very clearly what his own name is. And so that really stuck with me um, in really emphasizing what a huge impact stroke has on the very um, fundamental aspects of what makes us human. So when we think about dysphagia management, um, just a little quote from the Bible to start with, um, a, a man has no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. I think we are less merry at the moment because of COVID, uh, but it really um, highlights the centrality of eating and drinking in our lives. And as a, it also underpins its position in our culture. So if you think about food, you know, we think about the dana gedra, the um, um, wedding, the party, um, maybe aurudu, maybe Christmas, maybe Eid, all of it that brings people together in, in terms of sharing of, of food and drink. And so when a stroke survivor loses their ability to swallow and maybe is on alternative feeding or on a restricted diet, it is not just that they are unable to eat as before and eat what they would have liked to eat, their favorite food, or in the texture that is familiar to them, it is also a loss of the community role of family meals, of going out for meals and celebrations and festivals. And more and more within speech therapy, we are very concerned about how we encourage participation. So when we think about the role of speech and language therapists, it's true care. The Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists uh, informs us that Part of our role is to do an initial assessment of swallowing and communication difficulties for stroke. And then we have a role to play in training other healthcare professionals to undertake screening assessments as well. In the longer term, we work with the stroke survivor and members of the multidisciplinary team in terms of rehab work. We do a lot of work um, in training caregivers, uh, particularly in terms of supporting communication and, and dysphagia. We also have a supportive role within the medical team to help assess capacity, uh, for instance, in, in terms of being able to give consent. So given our um, training in communication, we are best placed, I think, to look at ways in which we can ensure that our uh, stroke survivor is able to understand uh, what a particular procedure might mean or what the recommendations might mean. And so we have a role to play there. We also are part of uh, the discharge plan from the stroke unit back into the community, uh, trying to make it as seamless as possible. And of course, then we continue our support um, either a, with offering an outpatient clinical service or working closely with organizations in the community to offer community-based rehabilitation. So in, to the question, why is dysphagia important in stroke care? And it, I think the stats really speak for themselves. If you look at some of the literature, we know that the percentage of people with dysphagia following stroke immediately post stroke is between 40 to 78%, depending on the study that you're looking at. Seven days later, it's, it drops to something like 27%, a, a month later to 17%, and then six months later to about 11%. But 
But another crucial thing to keep in mind for all of us working together is that an estimated 25% may die within that first year following the stroke with aspiration pneumonia, making it really important for us to work together to minimize the risk of aspiration. So courtesy of uh, colleagues from the National Hospital, they've sent a little bit of um, some stats from um, their work. So looking at a snapshot of their caseload on a random day, you, uh, of their dysphagia caseload, we see very clearly that the bulk of their, uh, the clients are from our stroke survivors, 47% in fact. So in terms of care pathways, an urgent referral to speech and language therapy within the first 24 hours is what is recommended by the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. Now that swallow screening, uh, which Prabhani uh, showed us, can be done by the speech and language therapist or by a, a trained medical nursing staff or by a medical officer. But as Prabhani very um, really emphasized very well, a comprehensive swallow assessment evaluation really must follow this screening because there's such a big chance of us missing, particularly silent aspiration. So a bedside assessment with cervical auscultation and instrumental evaluation of fees or video fluoroscopy where, where required and, and where that those services are available in, in the hospital would be really good. And part of our assessment also includes ICF considerations. So this is what the process looks like. I mean, each hospital would have its own dysphagia protocol. We spend a lot of time getting in-depth uh, case history information. Uh, we do the screening assessment and clinical bedside assessments, instrumental assessments. And we also gather information from our colleagues in the MDT in terms of positioning, in terms of nutrition, in terms of um, self-care, being able to eat on their own. So a lot of information, particularly from physiotherapy colleagues, uh, occupational therapy colleagues, a dietitian, dietetic colleagues, and, and the nursing staff. And all of this feeds into uh, our ICF framework which is what is on the screen right now. So if we take a closer look at that, so the first part of the ICF framework is looking at body function and structure. So post our assessment for a client with right CVA with dysphagia, we might find that in terms of the oral swallow, there's reduced range of motion in tongue and lips and jaw, we might see that the stroke survivor is finding it difficult to close their lips together, which results in a lot of secretions, um, an anterior spillage of the food and drink. We might find that there is poor tongue lateralization, which means that they're not able to clear the food that gets pocketed in, in um, the buccal cavity, for instance, put, again, putting them at risk of aspiration because unbeknown to them that food could uh, trickle down uh, to the trachea. It could be at a pharyngeal swallow, there may be poor pharyngeal constriction in terms of cognition. Maybe they don't have very good insight about pooling the food. They may not have very good insight about whether they're safe or not to eat. And there may be some impulsive behavior. Right. And so then that would impact on the activities and participation, because you might see, like we did in the demonstration, uh, I think it was Mr. Samar, Samar Singha, if I'm not mistaken, we saw the lovely gentleman cough when drinking the thin fluids. Um, if we did further assessment, as uh, Prabhani was saying, and we looked at other textures also in our, as part of our comprehensive assessment, we might see that uh, the client is unable to chew their uh, food um, very carefully. And so they may be at risk of, for other textures. 
uh, they may not be able to locate the food and liquid on the left side of the table because they may have a left-sided neglect. And when thinking about the environment and personal factors, it, it may be that the client is 72 years old, they may have diabetes and hypertension, which complicates their medical picture. They may not have adequate family support. So if, if the speech and language therapist wants the food modified to a period texture, for example, we are, we are very reliant on caregiver support. And if the family is not able to support that, th then that could be a challenge. And they may have difficulties accessing rehab, et cetera. So let's have a quick look at uh, the, the normal swallow. So I know the audio wasn't great, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move ahead. So like Rabani showed us, the screening assessment uh, would entail some observation um, at rest, uh, a dry swallow, and a 5 ml water test. And the this, and this screening is usually done within the 20, first 24 hours post-stroke. And really, it's like Prabhani said, just a pass-fail um, procedure. If the, if the stroke survivor fails it, then you would consider alternative feeding. So an injury, most likely, and then if they pass, you might think that they could have typical, a typical diet, but be monitored. And the recommendation is that a comprehensive swallow evaluation is undertaken within the 20, first 24 to 48 hours post-stroke. And why it's important could be, be um, because of the two client profiles that I'm about to share with you. So this is client A, 79 years old, has no past medical history, also no, no big complications. The client complains of food stuck in the throat. The 5 ml water test was done, but there was no cough observed. Right? But that having said that, there were changes in voice quality and throat clearing that were observed. So the question is whether we should be concerned or can we continue with oral feeding? And the answer would be, you know, speech therapists would tell you they are trained to really look at and notice voice changes in voice quality. And the change in voice quality, usually uh, speech therapists use this term, wet voice. And a wet voice quality would suggest that there is residue in, in the vocal uh, folds. Right, so this is an at-risk client, and so comprehensive assessment would be the, the next step forward. So this is a client with silent aspiration, no overt clinical signs that they are not managing the thin liquid in, in your 5 uh, ml water test. But... Um, and when I say overt signs, not the most obvious sign of coughing, but certainly sign, there are overt signs in terms of the voice quality changing and throat clearing. So much, much more subtle um, signs. In client B, here is someone who is 68 years old post-stroke and you do the 5 ml water test and there was no cough observed. Again, the question is, should uh, we continue to feed without further assessments. So in the first one, there was no obvious cough, but there were other signs 
predictable si predictive signs, which are red flags um, that we need to consider. In client B, there was no cough. But when we look at uh, a fees, we know that there is a lot of pooling, right? That puts this client at risk of aspiration. So again, um, forward assessment of comprehensive, robust assessment is really what was needed for both our client A and B. So let's really, you know, I'm telling you about uh, silent aspiration um, and suggesting that the 5ml water test alone is insufficient, but you don't have to take uh, my word for it. Let's, let's look at some of what the literature suggests. And here we are looking at a, a study by Deborah and colleagues from 2005 and by Langmore and colleagues from um, the year 2000. So in acute strokes, silent aspiration was identified in 25 to 28% of stroke survivors. That's quarter of our clients. In speech therapy, uh, we, we tend to use the word client more than patient. So I, I just want to clarify that. Protective cough may not be present due to vocal cord palsy or thick saliva that inhibits this or loss of sensitivity. And within the assessment, even when you try to get a voluntary cough, it may not be possible because of aphasia, for example. And here I want to really make a point of how our work in dysphagia and communication go hand in hand. You notice when uh, Prabhani gave the instruction to the lovely gentleman, he was able to follow that instruction. But there may be clients because of aphasia who are unable to understand the instruction and therefore may not be able to comply and, and give you a voluntary cough. So this is part of the consideration. It may be uh, that the client has apraxia, so um, coordinating muscles for the cough may be, um, may be difficult. The client may have cognitive issues and, and so may not be able to understand again what, your, what the task demand is. So after the screening for dysphagia, if there is an inconsistent response or you're not sure at all, I, the recommendation really is to please refer to speech and language therapy. We also look at uh, oxygen desaturation. And so during swallowing, this may be pre uh, predictive of aspiration. And there's a, in the studies, they've seen that there's a sensitivity of 70% to 87% and specificity of 39 to 87. So a really wide range there. But it is more useful really when you combine it, not, not on its own, but when you combine it with a bedside uh, assessment. So in isolation, this may not really be, be sufficient. I know that uh, I was reading a study last week in terms of COVID and uh, people of color in, in the UK uh, and a questioning of um, pulse oximetry readings. So this might be something that we need to come back to and, and evaluate. So we are guided by the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists and the American Speech and Hearing Association's recommendations of doing a screening and that to be followed quite quickly, quite promptly by a detailed clinical dysphagia assessment. In the absence of a speech and language therapist, because I know that we are not in every hospital in, in Sri Lanka, unfortunately right now, but hopefully in the future we, we will be, um, or because of COVID and they're not able to come to work, the recommendation initially is that when in doubt, the mantra really is when in doubt to continue uh, alternative feeding, uh, mainly because the repercussions, the consequences are, are so grave. So here is my colleague uh, Gauri, a speech and language therapist in Jaffna, 
doing um, initial assessment. So in terms of dysphagia intervention, what we're really concerned about is during the meal, how can we keep our clients safe? And so we look at compensatory strategies, strategies that we can offer to help minimize the risk of aspiration. Now that could be modifying the food, having looked at all of the textures and assessed all of the textures during the assessment, we would be able to quite confidently say which texture is best for the client, carries the least risk of aspiration. So food modification is a compensatory strategy. We look at posture modification as a key um, strategy, and we work very closely with our physiotherapy colleagues. So we could consider alternative methods uh, and swallow maneuvers. And so depending on what the issue is, a speech and language therapist might recommend particular types of swallow maneuvers to be done during the meal time. We also work on rehabilitation or stimulation strategies, and th that could be to stimulate muscle function or to stimulate swallowing function. And so that may be a little more longer term. We, we start, start straight away when it's safer and the client is medically stable, uh, but it varies uh, depending, the success varies depending on the level of dysphagia um, and other comorbid features. So in terms of dysphagia management, nutrition, hydration, and safety are our key areas of concern. And when we do the assessment, we would know whether the breakdown or the difficulties in the oral phase or the pharyngeal phase or the esophageal phase of the swallow. So then we will target that within, within um, the mealtime or within uh, therapy. We very much take an MDT approach and we look at referring on our clients for further assessment and, and undertake reassessment. In terms of compensatory methods, like I said, positioning and food modification are key. Swallow maneuvers, alternative feeding methods and food and nutrition management together with the dietitian and um, looking at utensils to support um, either self-feeding or um, minimizing the risk of aspiration. So you, you could have maybe a special for example, that only offers a little bit at a time or a special straw. And, um, and in terms of therapy, we're really looking at supporting the client to relearn lost function through exercises, through biofeedback, sensory stimulation, and electrical stimulation. But the key to all of our work, really central to the work that we do in dysphagia management, is our client and our caregiver. So training the client, training the caregiver, um, explaining why they need to sit in a particular way, why they need to have particular textures, why they may need to thicken their uh, plain tea, which is you know, a really difficult thing for clients to um, be able to do because they're so used to the texture and taste of their food. Um, all of that is really through client and caregiver training and that's central to the work that we do. In the little booklet that we put together, um, we offered these general guidelines that as an MDT we could follow. I've just highlighted in red some of the things that I would like to pull out um, as, as key considerations. Uh, one is that we need to make sure that the stroke survivor is awake and alert during all meal times. Um, I know in a busy uh, unit, sometimes, you know, uh, staff want to have so many clients to support, and this may not be a consideration, but it's imperative. 
posture is a key recommendation uh, because in general, having your head and neck upright um, would minimize the risk of aspiration. And here we rely on our physiotherapist colleagues to lead this discussion and the recommendations. And we work closely with the nursing staff because this also means that the ICU beds need to be adjusted to the angle that is suggested. It may be really nice to be able to inform the stroke survivor that it is the meal time, so they are ready for it. And for, to do so, we will have to use the communication system that has been introduced by the speech and language therapist. And that may be individual for, for, for one person that short sentences, for somebody else, it may be pictorial support or gestural support. Um, so it, it really depends on, on the client. We also need to make sure that all of the food and drink, including the medication, is in the consistency that has been recommended by the speech and language therapist. Um, and for stroke survivors, maybe for, for many, eating small amounts at a time throughout the day, at different intervals during the day, may be easier it may be easier for them to cope with that rather than having three large meals, particularly if there are issues with alertness or concentration or motivation, um, or if they're generally feeling tired. I've also said that it's good to offer small amounts per spoon at a time. Make sure that the uh, client has swallowed that spoon and cleared it before offering the next. And of course, you can give some verbal reminders um, to take small sips of water or to take small bites. As a team, I think it would be really useful for us to have some system in which we clearly put this, uh, like maybe a simple chart near the bed where we clearly indicate what texture um, the client is on, particularly for somebody who is nil by mouth, so that everybody in the MDT is, is aware of, of the recommendation. Another key general guideline is, because speech and language therapists might not be there full time, uh, we really rely on our colleagues to document any potential signs of aspiration that they might see during meal times when we're not around. And so that will uh, show that we have recommended. Um, and finally, we would really like the nursing staff to support us in offering uh, oral hygiene um, as part, as, as regularly, at, at daily and preferably after each meal so that there is no residue and no uh, risk of aspiration on, on residues. Now, when it comes to texture modification, um, in, in the past, you know, the UK has had a particular uh, classification system. The US was doing its own thing with using words like syrup consistency, et cetera. So there was a lot of variation. I mean, even, even locally, depending on whether you trained in the UK or the US or in India or locally, there, was a, there were different descriptors being used. And there may be different descriptors used also across colleagues, like our OT colleagues. So I think uh, as a result, there was an international initiative called the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative that came about in 2019. And they did, it, it consisted of a lot of experts from across the world doing robust assessments to figure out classification a classification system that could be applicable across countries, cultures, food types. Right, from our Asian cuisine to French cuisine um, to African cuisine. And so they propose the IDSI framework, 
And so in the past few years, we've been trying to promote this as a, as a profession locally as well. And there have been some interesting studies that have uh, been done internationally where hospitals have taken on the ITSI framework and um, the catering service have started labeling their food uh, as zero, as ITSI zero thin, ITSI one thick, uh, slightly thick or um, period, which is number four, right? So that there is uniformity across the hospital. So that might be something you would like to think about. And finally, I just want to push our current thinking a little bit and, and leave you with something to think about. In, uh, so finally, in terms of the dysphagia management, um, there has been a lot of discussion around food security um, in the last 10 or so years. And looking at food security and dysphagia management as a human rights issue and considering access or the lack thereof to food and drink as a human rights consideration. And so this may connect with, in our past history, you know, because of war, COVID-19, I think we are between poverty and access to food and healthcare. And the recommendation from the disability rights movement is really for us to consider uh, these intersectionalities or the nexus between poverty and access to food and health, and how that may actually have an impact on the type of recommendations that we as speech and language therapists or uh, healthcare professionals give. So for example, if I were to uh, request that a stroke survivor be on a particular diet and that uh, it's pureed and that the, the food consists of this, these particular types of vegetables and fruit, et cetera, I really do need to think about the ethics of that in terms of whether it's an accessible uh, or achievable um, recommendation. So I just wanted to flag that up for you because we are, we are in the midst of COVID. Madam, is it okay to continue or would, would you like a break? I have the little section on communication. Uh, how long would it take? It's about 10 minutes, madam. Yes, uh, uh, try to finish it soon. Okay. So speeding on to communication, Paulo Freire um, says that only through communication can human life hold meaning. And so the care pathway really is again a, a, a prompt referral to speech therapy. Um, Communication is seen as a right within the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists and speech therapists in general believe that this right means that you have a right to communicate using any means available to you. Right? So and up to a, an estimated third of all stroke survivors may experience some difficulty with communication, but the nature and severity may differ. So, in terms of differential diagnosis, we would be looking at aphasia, which uh, affects receptive and expressive language, both spoken and written. And we'll be looking at motor speech disorders of dysarthria and dyspraxia that affect clarity of speech. In terms of the prevalence, um, in studies that have been done, about 936 uh, patients have been found to have speech disorders on admission. And the bulk is dysarthria, um, five, uh, about 57% or 58%, and about 25% with aphasia. So the process of assessment is again, uh, each hospital might have a language communication protocol. We rely on the case history. We do screening and comprehensive assessments using a hypothesis testing approach. Uh, uh, to differentiate between the possible communication diagnoses. We rely also on MDT support 
in terms of positioning and hand function, et cetera, if we are looking at augmentative or alternative communication or AAC as a way forward. In terms of aphasia, here's my colleague from Jaffna again doing an assessment. So thinking about the ICF framework, again, we are, our focus is really about participation. For example, how do we get our client back to doing the roles that they used to do at home, in the family, and in the community, and maybe getting back to work? Different types of aphasias have been found. Um, so it could be cortical, subcortical, and other types, and also primary progressive aphasia. Um, al although it is dementia, um, and I've given a little bit more detail here. So the most common uh, type of aphasia we see is cortical aphasia. And when speech therapists do an assessment for cortical aphasia, they do various assessments of comprehension, assessment, fluency, and reading and repetition, reading and writing, as well as repetition tasks. And based on the findings, they classify the stroke survivor uh, to have different, uh, a different type of aphasia. And, and one is different to each other from the next. And this is, so one, a, a client could be anomic, for example, or have conductive aphasia, uh, or Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's, which you may be very familiar with. So this classification is important because that is what will lead to appropriate intervention. So again, in terms of using the ICF, we see that maybe the body structure that is uh, impacted is that there's difficulty with understanding spoken language, and this could affect uh, have a, the client in terms of having a conversation with somebody. And also in terms of participation, he may not be able to, he or she may not be able to play the role as the CEO because communication is central to their uh, work life. Here's just an example of um, somebody with Broca's aphasia. And again, I just want to flag up what it might mean in terms of the questions that you're asking. So in terms of impairment, you're asking what impairment most affects function in the current setting or at discharge based on the clinical assessments. For activity and participation, you're asking the question, what activities are most important to the individual in the current, in, when you're in the current, state at the stroke unit or on discharge. And again, for the environment, personal factors, what are those factors that hinder participation on, or activity, both at the stroke unit or when you're thinking about discharge? So intervention planning really is about closing the gap, right? What can the person do? What can't they do? Uh, and what does he do instead if they can't do? And how can we get the person to um, being able to do what they need and being able to request for what they want. So the overall aim is to facilitate communication using any means available, right, without any judgment, where we are saying all communication modes are equal and valid because we want to make the person as autonomous as possible. So at the stroke unit, this might mean establishing a really simple AA system, AAC system like a communication chart or using gestures or offering a pen and paper when you're having a consultation so that they can draw their answer or they can write their answer if their writing is intact. And this is, the, this is central to our, uh, making it person-centered care because often what happens is that we look at the caregiver and ask the caregiver questions and we are, expect the caregiver to answer for the client. Whereas really the stroke survivor is the best person to talk about their own health and not to mention having the right to do so. So in terms of therapy activities, we might do some activities at the impairment level, looking at body function and structure, where we are looking at restoring language function. 
We might also look at activity and participation where we are offering techniques to compensate for that impairment, but still being able to play those roles that they uh, have in, uh, in the family or at work. And we will do therapy to look at how we can restore communication function. So for body function and impairment level, it may be some picture naming activity or sen sentence completion, categorical naming, pointing task, copywriting or sound production work. And for participation, it could be label reading or naming. So maybe something functional like being able to read um, a letter that comes through from the bank, that kind of thing. Um, it may be fitting in bank slips, maybe using gestures. It may be that you're, we train the client to cue themselves to be able to produce sounds accurately. So really we are aiming to capitalize on the strengths that the client has and address the needs um, and to devise an individual communication system that is individual to the client's needs and wants and their uh, current strengths. And so this could mean restoring or stimulating the pathways to take on lost function it may be reorganizing the information or abilities that you have to circumvent the lost function, or it could be using a substitution method like gesture or um, picture, picture support, or even an iPad with a communication app. Motor speech disorders is also another possible communication um, diagnosis. And this could mean that you're looking at doing an assessment and getting perceptual and objective assessment details to be able to differentially diagnose between dysarthria and dyspraxia. And in dysarthria, we are looking at uh, differentiating between the types of dysarthrias. So the Mayo Clinic did a lot of research in the past uh, to suggest that there are perceptually distinguishable types of dysarthrias. And so when we assess, we assess um, what we call subsystems that collectively help produce speech sounds like breathing, phonation, uh, res resonance, articulation, and prosody. And then we figure out where at which level or which subsystem or subsystems the, the breakdown is. And then, so by doing so, we can decide on the type of dysarthria. And then the type of dysarthria will lead us to our intervention options, whether we base it on behavior modification or whether we look at some medical approach, including surgical options at times, or which subsystem, whether we work on respiration first, because that is an issue, or whether we work on resonance, depending on which subsystem has been affected. Dyspraxia, similarly, um, we will, in our assessment, we will look at whether there's a difference or difficulty for the client to start off producing a word, uh, whether there are inconsistencies or whether the speech is slow or whether they're showing overall groping movements of oral motor behavior, meaning that they're finding it difficult to start off the sound. So there may be a difference between volitional movements um, when you ask, or, or you know, when you ask them to copy something, or automatic movements. So when you ask them to copy something, that may be difficult. But if you ask them to recite some banner or prayers that they've memorized through rote memory, they may be able to do so. Just uh, just to flag up, right hemisphere disorder. Uh, this is often missed because it is a very complex picture um, because you can have varied levels of difficulty with memory orientation, communication, uh, reasoning, mood swings, visual neglect. And so it is just a cautionary note um, to alert you to the fact that we seem to really miss out um, this group, even though the prevalence is meant to be something like 42 to 49%.
So the key considerations is to continue is continuing in familiar roles and responsibilities to ensure participation, returning to work. We have an advocacy role to play in terms of removing barriers, returning to work, for example. So whether it is that uh, the, the office is wheelchair accessible or whether their client is able to work some days from home, as we all have been doing now, um, or whether different modes of communication are welcome. So we have to think about environmental, informational attitude and policy level barriers to ensure that our clients can get back into participation. So last couple of slides, in terms of facilitating communication at the stroke unit, again, all of these are in the book, in, in the chapter that we put together. I'm just flagging up a few um, strategies. We are not assuming that every uh, stroke survivor- Can make it short a little? Yeah. Yes, madam, I'll, I'll be done in one minute. Okay. Yeah, um, we're not assuming that every client will need uh, communication strategies, but in general, keeping our questions and instructions short and simple, modeling what we want them, what we are expecting the client to do. So modeling our instructions, offering opportunities, so pointing to what we are talking about or showing pictures to help them to understand what we are talking about and offering opportunities for the client or the stroke survivor to use any uh, means of communication available to them. And so my final thought is that what we really want to work together is to help make the stroke unit a place where all communication modes are encouraged and accepted and valued with no judgment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shamini. Thank you, Shamini. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, uh, in detail presentation on speech therapy and solving assessment for stroke patients. So now um, uh, I very much appreciate your contribution for this workshop and uh, uh, be informed that uh, your certificate will be available uh, um, at the uh, SLMA office. And uh, let me now uh, call upon Dr. Sorry, Ms. Prabhani Dineshika to receive her certificate for this contribution. Prabhani. Thank you, Prabhani and Shamini again. And uh, our next presentation is on nutrition for stroke. Uh, and uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Vasana Marsingha, Senior Registrar in Clinical Nutrition, uh, to make her presentation uh, on behalf of Dr. Inukaja. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Vasana Marsingha, uh, Acting Consultant Nutrition Physician. Actually, I'm doing this presentation on behalf of uh, Dr. Inukaja. She's the uh, head of the nutrition department in uh, Medical Research Institute. And actually, uh, let me uh, mention about this. She's the pioneer of our medical nutrition field in Sri Lanka. And uh, anyway, uh, first of all, I would like to convey my gratitude to organizing team in SLMA for giving us this opportunity to share our knowledge and experience uh, related to the nutrition management in stroke patients. Anyway, I know it's uh, not a timely topic uh, in the midst of this pandemic. Anyway, that uh, within this stringent period, that we have a half, half an hour for our presentation. So throughout my presentation, I would like to uh, uh, give a just an overview regarding uh, nutritional management in stroke patients. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, during the initial slides, I would like to discuss regarding available uh, screening and assessment methods of the nutritional management. And also I would like to uh, pay some attention regarding the screening methods of the dysphagia. And also in the middle of the presentation, it will be consist with the available nutritional strategies that we can use in acute stroke patients as well as in chronic patients. And also that uh, for the completion of my presentation, I would be 
discuss some strategy, strategies related to the how to use this nutritional implementation to prevent stroke as a primary prevention and as a secondary prevention. So first of all, uh, initiation, my initiation of my presentation. So I think this slide will help us to have some uh, overall idea about the where's the stroke in uh, as a global causes of deaths in the world. This source is a WHO global health estimates and you can see since year 2000 to 2019, that stroke is kind of a leading cause of uh, death in the world. So uh, if I, not only that, actually, uh, that it is kind of, it's the third leading cause of disability in adults in the world. And also that uh, more than 50% of post-stroke patients ended, ended up in weight loss, especially during first week to six months after this post-stroke period. So that way, when we turn into our data in Sri Lankan data, unfortunately so far there is no any comprehensive study or research has conducted uh, to know what is the malnutrition status among stroke patients. Anyway, according to the year 2010, indoor morbidity and mortality reports uh, that lead uh, stroke is a leading cause of hospital deaths in year 2010. Uh, and also in community prevalence, it's around 1.6 per 100 population in year 2012. And uh, that we could find a study which was conducted in uh, National Hospital Neurology in year 2011. And they have conducted to see that unmet needs of care in post-stroke survivors uh, in their units. So according to that, 75.9% patients have inadequate low calorie intake. So uh, that as a nutrition team, actually, when we manage the new patients with stroke, actually we should know with which patients who needs nutritional optimization. So in, in this uh, point, that we need to identify them. And if I just mention about how we identify these patients, there are several screening and assessment tools. Actually, they were, those uh, tools are globally accepted tools. And with this uh, limited time, I'm not going to uh, talk about in detail, but anybody can go through the web and these tools are freely available. And uh, especially NRS 2002 and MUST tool. And for the elderly patients, we can use mini nutritional assessment. And uh, usually that nutritional screening is recommended for each and every stroke patient. And after doing this screening, uh, screening uh, that we can detect who are the at risk of malnutrition. And after detecting these patients, then the, these patients should be referred for a further detailed assessment. For a further detailed assessment in gold standard method is to go for detailed clinical assessment. That means history examination and investigation. And also for the to be a user friendly, there are several screening tools as well. Uh, one tool is a subjective global assessment and also a GLIM criteria. And uh, details of these uh, tools also is available in the web. And uh, so actually that this assessment and screening is not a timely, it's, a, it's just a uh, one point. Actually, it, it's a dynamic process because we know that stroke is a chronic disease and it has a uh, sequelae. And so during this uh, disease process, we have to use this screening and assessment timely uh, to prevent uh, the, them end up in the malnutrition because this slide will help you to have an idea. Usually on admission in stroke patients, their malnutrition prevalence is around 10%. But uh, during initial uh, week, first week, they can end up in uh, malnutrition prevalence can be increased up to 25%. So it's actually, it's, uh, it's a significant percentage. So if we uh, act promptly, we can prevent this problem. And the later on also in rehabilitation phase, also that more than 50, uh, closer to 50% of these patients can be end up with malnutrition. So when we uh, talk about the malnutrition in stroke patients, so this is a disease specific malnutrition. Uh, so when we talk into the uh, stroke, so there are uh, different risk factors when we compare it to all of other diseases. So when we particular to the stroke, so this, I think this slide will help you to have a broader idea that I have uh, categorized into three broad categories about these risk factors. If it can be as a motor impairment, 
can be associated with sensory impairment and the psychosocial impairment. So that we know usually motor impairment is, uh, is a cardinal feature in a stroke. So with that, uh, for example, dysphagia, aphasia, aphasia and the paralysis, these uh, components can be directly reduced patients food intake and can end up with the malnutrition. And also the other components also directly or indirectly can affect patients food intake. And what is the problem of this malnutrition? Actually, the thing is, it's now well known. It's there's a more than enough evidence has shown malnutrition needs directly affect patients' mortality, morbidity. That means which increase the patient's infection and increase the patient's uh, hospital stay, ICU stay, and readmissions, and ultimately increase the pay, uh, healthcare cost for the country. And more than that, ultimately, which reduce the patient's quality of life. Actually, that actually that. As a multidisciplinary team, our, always our target is to improve patients' quality of life. So uh, that you can see it ultimately reduces patients' quality of life. So when we discuss about the risk factors, uh, I thought to little bit elaborate regarding the dysphagia because it's a kind of a hallmark. So uh, luckily that with my previous colleague, she has nicely explained about the dysphagia. So I, actually I'm not going to take too much time about it. Uh, to, uh, to discuss about uh, this slide. Anyway, I would like to mention that usually dysphagia accounts around two to five uh, fold risk of malnutrition in weeks after the stroke. So this also shows uh, <coughs> dysphagia usually uh, that uh, uh, in stroke patients, we know that stroke is uh, more prevalent in elderly group. So we know with aging, there's another associated factors as well. So usually elderly group, they have HIV problems and frailty, depression, uh, dementia, these all kinds of factors also contribute to the reduced food intake. And also these patients can have another comorbidity factors and recurrent infections. And these factors also increase the patient's energy demand. That means mesal metabolic rate can be increased. And also elderly patients, they can have a malabsorption issues as well. So altogether, these all factors ultimately reduce patients' food intake and also reduce fluid intake and ultimately can end up with the malnutrition and dehydration. So that's why we need to uh, uh, address dysphagia, especially in stroke patients. And when we have a patient with uh, uh, stroke, how we uh, look into this dysphagia. So usually if, uh, if, if, that usually if I get a patient uh, referral from the neurology units, First of all, we have to see whether the patient is conscious or rational and able to sit or sustain cooperation that factors. If it seems patient is not in good, uh, uh, conscious level is not uh, adequate, so these patients are not suitable enough for oral feeding. So in that case, we consider about the mode of nutrition delivering into the uh, tube feeding. If not so, then we have to think about the dysphagia before delivering oral feed. So, in that uh, uh, occasion that we need to take support of speech therapist and with them we do the new uh, dysphagia screening. I think initially it's nicely explained uh, regarding bedside uh, nutritional assessment methods, basic ones and the use of the instrumental assessment. So anyway, with this assessment, uh, sorry. Uh, with this assessment, according to the assessment, we uh, uh, mode of the nutrition uh, optimization, we go with the texture modified diet or tube feeding or parental nutrition. Uh, again, if I little bit elaborate regarding the dysphagia screening, the instrumental assessment, unfortunately, it's not much uh, familiar in our adult setups, but in Lady Ridgeway Hospital and uh, Ragam Rehabilitation Units, I have seen. And uh, this is the one instrumental me method. It's a fibro optic endo uh, endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. It's actually bedside test, and it's a, uh, we use a flexible nasopharyngoscope to uh, see the anatomy and the physiology of swallowing. And usually, uh, that positive aspects of this uh, test is uh, we can use it even in a severely handicapped and uncooperative patients. And also, uh, there, there's a several. Uh, that uh, disadvantages as well, like uh, usually we cannot uh, assess all swallowing cases with the fees. And these sometimes patients might complain of gagging and 
uh, that uh, discomfort during this procedure. Another instrumental assessment is the video fluoroscopy. Uh, actually, this is the gold standard method to screen uh, dysphagia patients. Uh, and the issue is uh, this video fluoroscopy. It's uh, that, uh, that uh, it's, we have to take patient uh, to the radiology department. It's not a bedside assessment. And also uh, the positive things are, we can assess all three phases of swallowing, oral, uh, pharyngeal, and the esophageal phases. And also which help, help us to uh, detect any micro aspiration. So especially in pediatric age groups, it's very, really important uh, proceed. So when we discuss about the malnutrition in stroke patients, we cannot uh, forget about the sarcopenia because it's kind of overlooked factor in our country. Sarcopenia means usually that the stroke always uh, comes with the immobility. So when patients uh, having immobility uh, with the uh, nutritional poor nutrition, so they can end up with the sarcopenia. That means their muscle strength, mass, and the physical performance can be reduced. So to improve the uh, sarcopenic status of these patients, it, it's actually uh, nutrition alone, we cannot do that. So most of the time we need to take a support of occupational therapist, physiotherapist, and we have to incorporate with the phys uh, physical rehabilitation programs with the adequate uh, quality proteins. And also that the another factor, especially in chronic stroke patients is the pressure injuries. Actually, this also kind of overlooked factor uh, factor in our patients. Uh, as a nutrition team, actually, th that we have a responsibility in this aspect because uh, reasons for pressure injuries, there can be an inadequate intake of, of quality proteins as well as inadequate intake of several micronutrients. So that we should know how to assess micronutrient status of these our patients. Actually, that uh, usually nutrition team, they are well trained to uh, do a uh, a better assessment and to assess whether the patient is on uh, adequate uh, intake with their diet and the other supplements. So when we manage nutrition uh, in our stroke patients, actually that when we have a referral from the uh, neurology team, actually just uh, only one day, it's not like that. We It's kind of a process. We have to follow up these patients because their nutritional needs and the way of strategies can be changed according to the patient's stage. In acute stroke patients, usually they are in ICU setup and according to their critical ill stage, whether the patient in egg phase, flow phase, and the hemodynamically stable or not, gut is functioning or not, according to that, we prepare our nutrition plan. And in chronic stroke patients, our main target is to maintain their bone mass, muscle mass, prevent them getting sarcopenia, osteopenia, osteoporosis, as well as uh, we have to prevent them uh, go into the sarcopenic obesity because with their immobility, they can be end up with the sarcopenic obesity. And the another thing is the prevention side. We know stroke patients, uh, even after one stroke, they can uh, prone into another recurrent attack. So uh, there's uh, some role in nutrition people to uh, support uh, neurology team to uh, uh, for the, this prevention aspect. So when I, when I talk about the nutritional strategies that we can use to optimize our stroke patients, that main thing is uh, giving a texture modified diet. So when we talk about the texture modified diet, I, I think the previous presentation, it was nicely explained. And you can see there's in past, there was some kind of a confusion so, uh, we, with this terminology. Uh, because in uh, different countries, you can see uh, that we are using thickened fluids and the uh, texture modified feeds, semi-solid and solid diet. So that uh, terminology is different from country to country that usually we use another country's guidelines and protocols to support our, uh, to improve our patients' uh, nutritional management because that uh, always we have to practice evidence-based medicine. So when we use this evidence-based medicine and when we, uh, use their guidelines that there should be a uh, common terminology, otherwise it will be confusing. That's why to uh, prevent this confusion that in year 2016, they have introduced International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, I think which was uh, nicely explained previously. And I don't think this is time to uh, go into detail about uh, that 
and anybody can if go through the web can have a better idea and about uh, when i turn into our setup uh, we also use several nutritional strategies in our patients especially in, uh, in national hospital icu setup uh, in our nutrition team they are doing their uh, preparing their tailor made uh, nutrition plans in our patients so especially we can use pre thickened oral nutrition supplements and use manual thickening powders especially for prevent aspiration in these patients so i think this slide might help you to have a overall idea how we manage uh, stroke patients in point of nutritional optimization so if we for example if i have a patient if a patient with acute or sub acute stroke first of all we have to look whether the patient is on a, under mechanical ventilation or impaired consciousness if it's so patient is in icu so then we have to look into whether patient is is there any contraindication for the enteral nutrition for the can we get gut for their feedings for to decide this we have to liaise with the that team it might be the critical ill team icu team or neurology team and after discuss with them we decide if there is a, a contraindication for enteral nutrition especially if patient is not hemodynamically stable or gut is not functioning in that case we have to think about the parental nutrition support but i would like to mention here it's very uh, rarely we uh, it's, it's this requirement is very rare uh, but if there is no any contraindication for tube feeding so enteral nutrition support so usual recommendation is to initiate enteral nutrition support within 72 hours and if uh, even though when we are given tube feeding support we have to discuss with the team again and again regarding the duration of they are tentative period of giving this tube support if it they supposed to give it more than 28 days again it's it's a time to consider about the long term feeding support so we have to think about the peg feeding or something like that so uh, if the team is uh, uh, suggesting it's uh, most probably it's not it's uh, not no, not more than 28 days in that case we can think about the uh, some strategies like applying nasal breathing especially this is uh, supportive for the nursing team to keep that ng tube in situ uh, without displacement because we know that usually stroke patients it's not uncommon in that but removal of ng tubes to prevent this problem we can use that nasal breathing and the uh, it's regarding the if the patient is in icu setup uh, with uh, mechanical ventilation or something like that and uh, if the patient is Uh, right, uh, conscious and if it seems we can go with the oral uh, nutrition so before that uh, again we have to think about the dyspepsia uh, like before we have to screen them for the dyspepsia with use of the bedside simple test or instrumental uh, test accordingly and after this assessment if patient is severely malnourished we have to think about the oral we can have a support of oral nutrition supplements as well or with the normal diet and uh, and if it with the assessment if it seems patient is not suitable enough for if there are features suggestive of microaspiration pet voice and that sort of problems then again we have to think about the uh, tube feeding support but anyway throughout this process during the tube uh, feeding we have to take uh, support of the speech therapist to uh, they have to gradually assess and gradually train these people to uh, go into uh, oral uh, feeding as well because we have to gradually train them this is my last slide actually that i would like to just mention regarding the what are the uh, steps that we can use to primary and secondary prevention of stroke actually this is a uh, just i'm just mentioning everybody knows these strategies but to completion uh, always it's uh, better to maintain healthy weight and also we always advise to be physically active at least 150 minutes per week sometimes if in secondary prevention with a stroke patient so it uh, should be a kind of a tailor made one sometimes in another countries they use uh, support of the occupational therapist as well and the another thing is a healthy balanced diet especially uh, rainbow concept should be encouraged that underlying rationale of uh, rainbow diet is the colorful fruits and vegetables usually we know with the colorful fruits and vegetable which is very rich in phytochemicals and lot of micronutrients and actually studies have shown it's having a uh, effect of it pre prevention of stroke 
mm-hmm. and also we we encourage to go with dash diet especially for the stroke uh, i have hypertension patients and we advise them to cut down their salt intake mm-hmm. because usually in our country according to the last study that our usual salt intake is more than th- around 13.5 gram that means uh, it's more more than double of the recommendation uh, so you should because the main reason is there's a lot of hidden salt in our food uh, even with the sauce and lot of foods it's having a hidden salt so dash diet is encouraged usually dash diet uh, salt recommendation is to around 2/3 of uh, salt Two third of teaspoon salt, and also we encourage to quit from smoking. And if patient is on alcohol, uh, explain them regarding not to exceed the safe limit. So these are the uh, just uh, preventive uh, strategies. And uh, as my last slide, I would like to give some home uh, take home messages. Actually, we know that the stroke is a burden. Burden of stroke in Sri Lanka is now alarming. Uh, and the nutrition care is an integral component of post stroke management and but uh, uh, i think it's still it's kind of overlooked this factor in sri lanka uh, thank you so much for giving uh, this opportunity to share my knowledge and experience uh, with you all thank you uh, thank you very much dr vasana mar singh for that excellent presentation thank you uh, we really value your contribution to us this workshop let me award you the certificate of appreciation thank you. so now we have moved on to our the last presentation of the workshop that is uh, another uh, important very important component of rehabilitation and how i mean uh, how uh, the patients that who develop stroke gradually improve and then we have to uh, uh, send them back to the community so integration to, into the community uh, becomes equally important so i'm thankful to mr chandana ranavira Arachi, the director of the Ministry of Social Services, for agreeing to do this presentation on social services for stroke mm-hmm. patients. Uh, so let me now invite Dr. Uh, Mr. Chandana Ranavira Arachi, Director of uh, Social Services, Department of Social Services. The uh, Chandana, over to you. Ah uh, yes. Ah. Uh... Yeah, during the recent past, uh, there has been a gradual opening up to carry out social intervention in the uh, health sector, uh, leading a new way in uh, perfect medical intervention made for patients in the uh, health sector. Uh, the following diagram will help to get an idea in in this connection. So, it is clear from this diagram that uh, with medical intervention. in the event of an accident or illness to a person uh, the social intervention uh, begin and when medical intervention uh, gradually decrease according to the uh, prevailing conditions over time the social intervention gradually reach to the maximum level uh, the various uh, the why social intervention is important important uh, the opinion of various uh, professionals in the field of health uh, was that a social, social intervention is very important in achieving uh, patients well be as a result of this uh, necessity for scientific intervention of a certain part party to explore uh, the matter such matter uh, such as uh, patients medical balance so it's very important to all of you know that the the medical the med, sorry, mental balances the mental balances is very important uh, because uh, just after the accident the person is uh, totally uh, out of the the, the mental uh, balance so it's very important to the uh, involve of the patient's uh, med- mental balance and also the medication uh, and therapeutic methods Uh, and also the family economic balance so if uh, the the person who has uh, an accident is uh, the breadwinner of the family uh, it will be the huge problem of the family's medical uh, medical uh, family's uh, economical uh, income and also the basic problems in the family uh, basic problems that need to be solved at home so there are some uh, the basic needs 
uh, and uh, it will increase the facility of the home uh, uh, after the persons become the disabled. And also the equipment uh, which are required. So there are some the important uh, and the specific, specific equipments uh, required for the person to uh, become the disabled. And also the access facilities. Uh, as a result, uh, according to the request made by Dr. Narendra Pinto, uh, orthopedic surgeon Sri Lanka spinal cord network, uh, in the year of uh, 2040, the Department of Social Services to provide the services of the social services officer to the uh, spinal cord accident uh, special uh, unit in Colombo National Hospital. Uh, uh, at present, most of the major hospitals in the country have appointed officers uh, on full-time basis, and there are some officers in the uh, part-time basis also. Uh, the patient's welfare services provided by the social services uh, officers in the hospitals hmm? So, uh, welfare services provided in the hospitals are mainly uh, divided into two parts. Uh, first one is uh, performance of welfare services within the hospitals for patients who are being treated in hospitals. The services uh, the, to be uh, carried out by the social services division for the problem and need of the patients that arise during the case conference or daily ward round conducted by the rehabilitation team. Uh, for an in, in patient are delivered to the patients and the relevant rehabilitation team. If it, uh, if it was decided to uh, send the patient to home from the hospital at any time, uh, the social services officer coordinates the uh, provisions of commode toilet facilities if he needed, uh, wheelchair uh, on requirement, uh, access facilities, as, is, as well as the economic development of his family members, uh, education facilities of the children who are uh, in schooling, uh, and also the external facilities and uh, knowledge uh, required for the patient uh, to be socialized. Uh, and also the officer carried out further explaining on medical advices to the patients and his family members. Uh, because they are element of the, this kind of uh, the illnesses and other things, the disabilities. Uh, in the event of an accident uh, or hospitalization of person and the coordination of other uh, related services at the special occasions. Also in such uh, cases, an uh, information report uh, is prepared for the patient for use in future rehabilitation plan. Uh, and the second one is uh, coordinating of welfare services with the social services officers of the uh, relevant divisional secretariats for the patients who are discharged from the hospital. Uh, in relation to the above matter, uh, doctors and the therapeutic, therapeutics uh, advise the patient to use the prosthetic foot, crutches, wheelchair, and other uh, assistive devices. And he need uh, when a patient leave the hospital ward, especially an orthopedic ward. Uh, and uh, in such cases, arrangements are being made by the social services officers of the relevant hospital to meet those needs as much as possible by uh, connecting the relevant persons, uh, uh, institutions, organizations, uh, so on. The most important thing that the uh, that happens here is the great effort to social services officers to deliver those equipments or services to the patient's home on or before leaving the hospital. Uh, and also the, uh, the social services officers will uh, engage of the following matters also in, uh, very effectively. They're providing vocational training facilities for the target groups. So under this, so we have one uh, vocational training uh, centers 
uh, in the Ragama Rehabilitation Hospital premises uh, at the moment uh, before the, the this uh, the COVID situation, there were about uh, 15 uh, the the 15 uh, persons who, who engage with the vocational training, and also we have uh, eight vocational training centers throughout the country. Uh, and uh, there are about 700 uh, students uh, throughout the country uh, for uh, vocational uh, obtained vocational training in different fields and uh, region career opportunities and counseling. It is one of the most important things. Uh, the all the uh, the medical officers and the uh, in uh, many the problem with their jobs and uh, at that time they make in contact uh, making contact with the department of labor too and coordinating on uh, providing compensation and making aware of family members and the community about uh, the disabled disabilities and referring for legal aid services if required and maintain and strengthen the organization for the persons with disabilities. And I think uh, the, the MOH uh, and the officers uh, will aware that we have a self-help group uh, in uh, in the divisional secretariat level. We have uh, four or five self-help group uh, in the divisional secretariats and the one uh, group in the uh, divisional secret, secret, the secretariat uh, divisions. Uh, using this uh, organization, so we can aware the uh, disabled per person uh, and we educate and provide the the many assistance and the uh, we using that group we empower the disabled person to uh, their uh, rights and their livelihood and the many ways and. Uh, provide housing and other facilities for the relevant person. And uh, bringing the problems of the persons with disabilities to the national level. So we have that organization, it's national, uh, the organization, national body to uh, obtain their problems from the uh, divisional and district level. And bringing the sport uh, capabilities of the persons with disabilities to the national level. So uh, we organized that event uh, before the COVID situation. Uh, I mean, we conducted the, the, that, uh, the sports event in 2018. After that, we are unable to conduct that uh, sports meets. Um, that uh, is the national um, national uh, sports uh, meets for the uh, disabled persons. So we organized to conduct that uh, sports uh, uh, sport meeting this year in uh, this august but uh, we are unable to uh, conduct it so in here we can uh, we can develop them up to the uh, national level and then after we have a uh, link with the uh, paralympic committee and we provide our the selected uh, persons to the paralympic committee to uh, represent representing sri lanka in paralympic game and begin the uh, artistic and cultural abilities to the persons with disabilities to the national level. In here, we conducted the uh, sit-through uh, program that is the, uh, the, uh, the one of the, the most uh, the popular cultural programs conducted by the Department of Social Services. Uh, and that program also we are unable to uh, uh, conduct last uh, two years. And this year, we, we will plan to Organize that event in uh, November. We are able to conduct that event too. Uh, and in this event, we did uh, the and our vocational training institutions. Uh, but uh, so that there is one of the most colorful and the most uh, the popular event in Sri Lanka. Uh, it was the uh, it was conducted in 1980. Sorry, 2018. Uh, at uh, last 2018. 
and uh, making aware of health staff on services activities, supporting of organizations of uh, patients, uh, Sri Lanka Stroke Association, the organization like Sri Lanka Stroke Association, introducing of music uh, therapy programs, making aware of public officers on the social service activities. Uh, participate in a national and international conferences, interagency coordination. It's very important to the uh, coordinate uh, with the other relevant agencies, especially the uh, disability secretariat for the disabled person and uh, the local uh, health organization uh, and uh, NGOs also, providing knowledge and disability persons programs and first aid to target groups. And uh, let's uh, move to the uh, welfare cycle of the social services. Uh, and here, according to the welfare the cycle, the welfare activities uh, commence from the uh, instance of the persons become ill or uh, disabled. And at the end, it will be able to get a rough idea on how uh, it is done by the social services divisions of the hospitals and the social services divisions of the divisional secretariats. Uh, on various uh, interventions up to the treatment, rehabilitation uh, complete. And the uh, person's uh, back home and is rehabilitated with his family and the surrounding community until he uh, recovers from the illness, uh, disability, and adapts to a normal uh, lifestyle, or uh, he can do their work uh, with disabilities. Uh, and working as a team of medical staff nursing staff, uh, therapists, social workers, attendants, as well as patients too. And even their uh, caregivers for all these purposes will be very helpful for success of patients' uh, welfare services. Uh, such a, a scientific and complex process cannot be performed by a single officer. And it should be a dynamic of a well-organized uh, team. Uh, then I, I'll move to the, uh, the what are the, what are the parties providing welfare services and direct relationships are being maintained at the hospital level as well as the rural and regional level among the following parties uh, in providing patient services by social services officers, uh, especially sick persons and the persons with disabilities, and also hospital staff, uh, clients, family members, caregivers friends and rural community groups and organizations uh, and other field officers and other officers, including the social services officer of the divisional secretariat. In here, the most of the time, so our officers uh, coordinate with the other officers, with, uh, especially in the uh, non-governmental organizations and the donors. Sometimes we are unable to provide all the requirement of the, uh, uh, the patient. But uh, the, the most of the officers have a good uh, uh, the relationship with uh, other non-governmental organizations and the, uh, the some individual donors. So they, uh, they are they are, uh, they communicate with them and they uh, get the assistance of uh, the other non-governmental organization and the individual donors. So that is the one of the, uh, the main strength of our officers have. Uh, and also, uh, we need uh, the assistant of the medical diary and the technical services officers. Uh, if we want to the uh, level and the economic situation of the family, so we get the report from the medical diary. And uh, if we need provide some uh, toilets, uh, the common toilet, the uh, um, facility, uh, we need to get the assistance of the technical officer of the divisional secretariat. The likewise. And uh, those are the, the organizations uh, that we need uh, yeah, the continuous assistance to. Uh, have this, uh, and also the challenges uh, that the officers face in this situation. So, the lack of financial or the other resources we can clean out the emergency patients. So, I mentioned earlier. So, we want to provide, if we want to provide uh, the touches or wheelchair when they leave the hospital. So 
sometimes we are unable to provide uh, within the short period, shortest period of time. Uh, so at that time, they coordinate with the provincial council, the Sabaha, and uh, sometimes donors and other non governmental organizations, and they provide that the facilities to them. Uh, so we have a limited uh, the resources and the, the financial resources uh, to conduct this kind of program. Weaknesses uh, occur interagency and the interpersonal relationship at certain instances. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the social services work is the uh, dual subject uh, to the provincial council. So, there are some the problem and the overlapping of the interagency or the interpersonal uh, interpersonal uh, from the central government and the uh, the provincial government. And failure to establish an appropriate uh, centralized system to provide proper services. And problem remained with the uh, updating of knowledge. So sometimes uh, the office is very uh, the, the little opportunity to update, it, especially in the health, uh, the, the, from the, uh, uh, the Minister of Health and the other uh, update of the their new findings and other things. Uh, lack of proper awareness of some hospital authorities on patient well-being, welfare services provided by social services officers. Uh, that some hospital op op officers and the uh, hospital directors are well aware of our officers and uh, uh, they work together. Uh, and some the hospitals, they are not aware about these officers and the, uh, the role of the social services officers. Uh, and also the lack of basic facilities and uh, meteorological the development issues. And we have a strength of the uh, social services officers. We have 36 um, social services officers attached to the uh, main uh, the leading hospitals, uh, full time, uh, 18 persons, and the others are part time. Or the, uh, um, the sometimes they 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 uh, engage with the as they request of the hospital authorities. And also we have uh, roughly uh, 400 or 380 social services officers attached to the uh, divisional secretariats of the uh, all the district and the district secretariat. So that is the one of the main strength that we have. So they have the good uh, the coordination and the relationship with the uh, uh, divisional level uh, and the rural organizations and they are the uh, they are the, they are the person who uh, engage with the, uh, uh, the CBR programs also, and most of the officers are the, the university graduate and they have a, a good experience in the the field. Uh, and so we have allocated only ten million uh, rupees in this year. So uh, so we we are we are dealing with some uh, the government budgetary allocations and the other organizations uh, non governmental organizations to provide uh, those services to the uh, the disabled persons uh, and these are some uh, big that we provide for the uh, to some person to uh, increase their uh, the livelihood uh, using the uh, uh, especially some uh, CBR programs, and uh, those are so we call normally we uh, obtain project proposal from the divisional secretariats to uh, provide facilities to them, uh, maybe a comat facilities, comat toilets, access facilities, uh, wheelchairs, uh, the, the proposal for the uh, develop, development of their um, self-employment. And we are we provide this uh, the training for the self employment like that. So the, this is the uh, end of my presentation. So before I conclude my presentation, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Padma Ratna and your institution to give me this opportunity to uh, express uh, the uh, all of the Department of Social Services. Uh, on this uh, subject. Thank you, Irma. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Mr. Chandana uh, for this uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your cons contribution uh, throughout. Uh, whenever that we are in need of contributions from the Department of Social Services, we know that you are ever ready, and then you made contribution to our the book that was the, that was published as part of this project. So thank you uh, for all your contributions to uh, SLMA, to the uh, stroke workshop, as well as uh, to medical profession in general. Uh, your the contribution will be acknowledged in the course by awarding you the certificate that we award to all our resource persons. I think that brings to an end into the uh, this course uh, that we organized. Uh, I think I'll move on to the podium there. Right. Uh, this brings to an end to the, um, the workshop that we organized, the stroke unit care for clinicians um, that uh, went on over a week. There were five Zoom lectures followed by a uh, half a day workshop. Uh, there were many who contributed, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, to make this program a great success. There were about uh, 10, 12 or 16 resource persons. Uh, they con constituted uh, the consultant neurologists, uh, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, uh, and uh, social service officers nutritionists and so on. Uh, and uh, there is a book that uh, is in the process of uh, in the print and that would be available in few weeks and that we'll be able to give to all that who uh, got registered for this uh, course. And then there is a certificate uh, to be awarded. Uh, and um, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, certificate will be available uh, for all others uh, who join online for lectures as well as the uh, workshop. So let me now call upon uh, the uh, registrars or um, senior registrars in uh, rehabilitation who, have, uh, who are here in person uh, joining the workshop to receive their certificates. Uh, Dr. Chamarabi Jayatunga. And Dr. Gasly, Uh, before I wind up, uh, let me again thank uh, our two very efficient council members, the ac and academic chair, Professor Sudarshan Ivasala Tantri, and Dr. Chaturi Suravira for their commitment, and also Dr. Ajini Araslingam and Dr. Champika Gunavadana contributing uh, very efficiently in the team, as well as Dr. Sachin and uh, Vihanga the technical uh, officer of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the other uh, auditorium staff of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Thank you very much for all of you uh, for joining online as well as for being in this auditorium. And thank you and stay safe. <laughs>